Good evening. Welcome to the Thursday, July 6, 2017 regular meeting of the City of Morro Bay's Harbor Advisory Board. And we do have a quorum. We do have two members uh, absent this evening, at least so far. Uh, Dana McClish will not be with us, and Mr. Maloney may be with us a little bit later. Uh, please uh, follow me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One of our seats, uh, one of our seats per bylaw is for a, a commercial fisherman's organization here in Morro Bay. And there are three alternates to that position depending upon uh, which, which of the fishermen are out working. Uh, Jeremiah O'Brien was with us for a period of time. And uh, this evening we have uh, Owen Hackleman in the seat. Welcome, Owen. So the next is um, any advisory board announcements and or and or liaison announcements when we are get done with that. Gene, no. Owen, no. Lynn, no. Bill. I do not have it. Nor do I. Matt. Okay. Our uh, city council liaison is Matt Makowetsky, who was with us this evening. Thank you, Matt. So this next item is the public uh, comment period for things that are not on our agenda this evening or for those who cannot attend a an agenda item posted agenda item later on and do we have any such at this time please come forward to the podium state your name and have at it my name is Doug Hill uh, the address uh, 990 Ridgeway Morro Bay I don't know AGP is the, is the podium mic on? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, I'll talk a little closer. Is that better? Okay. Um, 990 Ridgeway, Morro Bay. Um, my wife and I have been uh, kayaking here in Morro Bay for over 20 years. Um, as uh, I understand that, that the uh, board has sought or received uh, some grant to, to uh, uh, provide for or build a, a, a kayak or a, a low, low dock for... Uh, low boats. Um, I'd like to advocate for a, um, a floating type dock uh, if, if that if that funding comes available. Um, the current situation for launching kayaks is difficult here. The, the bo regular boating uh, docks are much too high to get in and out. Um, concrete ramps are not suitable for um, the types of kayaks that we have, um, fiberglass or composite kayaks you just don't launch that way they're too delicate so you you choose to launch from from boat docks and uh, there are currently no none available that are that are that low to, to the public so um, I'd like to advocate for that okay thank you uh, Eric can you can you inform us yeah currently we have a grant with the Department of Boating Waterways and we're starting into the engineering and permitting for a uh, major overhaul of the launch ramp, ramp itself, boarding floats, pavement, fish cleaning station, restroom, and part of that um, project has a low freeboard kayak boarding float. Currently the design has it kind of off the fish cleaning station there in the corner. I don't think that's the best for wind and tide, um, so that's going to be a work in progress, but we are intending to locate such a float somewhere in the neck of the woods down there between Tidelands Park and the launch ramp for those sorts of folks to have a better access than using the standard launch ramp. And any preliminary data about how, how high it would be off the water and its overall size? The height, they're pretty standard. The state boating waterways builds these all over the state, so there's a pretty standard design. They're, you know, probably half the height of a normal dock, maybe a little less. They're, they're made to be, you can basically get off at the same level as the kayak, so you can slide sideways and not have to climb up or down. 
Um, Size-wise, that's yet to be determined. Kind of depends on where exactly it's going to fit and where it goes. But um, obviously, big enough to hold at least a couple, two, three, four kayaks at a time, so people can stage and then get off. Thank you. And what's the best way for uh, those who are interested to follow the uh, des the, end the design process? At some point, I would intend to bring some design elements back through the Harbor Advisory Board as we get into engineering and start getting the engineers working on it and, and laying things out. I'll bring it back through the Harbor Advisory Board for input to get public input, so watch the agendas. And that would be by way of your uh, department staff report? It, some of it could come in the staff report. I would say if people want to stay notified, sign up on the city's Notify Me, go on the on the city's website and you get notified for Harbor, by, Harbor Advisory Board agendas and just keep an eye on agenda and when one comes up, when it shows, you know, input or whatever on the launch ramp project, then they can come make their um, comments or write something in at that point. Okay, thank you. Is that, you have enough information for now, folks? Okay, good, thank you. Uh, any other public comment at this time that is not on the agenda or relative to the agenda later on? Seeing none, we move on to the consent calendar. And the first item is approval of minutes from the Harbor Advisory Board meeting that was held on May 4, 2017. Any correction? Uh, we're gonna wait, I saw Mr. Maloney walk in, we're gonna wait for him. And uh, before we move on here, unless they disappear. He might have taken a rest break. So, so, so we'll move on to this end of this item. So any, um, any, no, no, Bill? Okay, I have none. So do I hear a motion to approve the advisory board meetings from May 4, 2017? So moved. Do I hear a second? Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. Carries. Item A2 is approval of minutes from the Harbor Advisory Board meeting held on June 1st, 2017. Any corrections or comments from the board? Bill? No. Lynn? Owen? No. Gene? Okay. And do I hear a motion to approve? Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. And now I do see Mr. Maloney coming to us, so we'll we will, in fact, wait 30 seconds for him. Welcome, Neil. Hello, sir. When you get situated, we are working on consent calendar item A2. Do you have any, any, there is a motion on the, on the floor already, so, um, We'll move right straight to that. And uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the Harbor Department Status Report. Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as usual, we got some Harbor Patrol statistics and other news of noteworthy news. Um, statistics since we last met in June, we had 12 emergency responses, 136 calls for service, which are anything from um, urgent things to just simple things like people wanting to um, dump their oil or oil dump or whatnot. Um, 41 assist to other agencies, typically state parks, sometimes Coast Guard, 31 enforcement contacts and 14 weather hazards, most likely this time of the year. It's probably small craft advisories for wind in the springtime. Um, some of the noteworthy patrol activity, we had some capsized kayaks and struggling paddle boards in the strong spring winds and tidal conditions, um, educating some tourists who were um, trying to pick an otter up and put it in their boat because they thought a baby otter needed some help. So um, that's not uncommon that people see the baby otter. When they, when they get separated from their mother, it happens pretty regular. They start screaming out in a pretty loud voice and people think it's in distress and they go up and grab it. And Usually baby otters don't put up a lot of fight and they'll wrap it in a towel or whatever and bring it somewhere and think they're doing good. So um, the good news of that, we've had two of those over the last year. Um, we worked with Fish and Wildlife, uh, Mike Harris, the local otter expert, and were able to bring both those otters back into the wild and find the mother. One of them went, one of those YouTube videos we took went absolutely viral. 
Um, so we were able to reunite those otters with their mothers. So just folks out there, if you see otters, uh, you think they're in distress, call somebody, call the Harbor Shoal Coast Guard, City of Morro Bay, and let them deal with it. Don't take it into your own hands. Um, next item, I'm laying right into that. Um, still getting a fair number of disturbances of sea otters. As you know, there's been a big increase in otters inside the bay, mostly in the Target Rock area, though they seem to move between there and Coleman Beach and over by the South Tee Pier. But there's a good 15, 20 resident otters that are around. And of course, people want to get up close and see them as close as possible. Um, state parks in the state of California has worked really diligently putting together a sea life stewards program um, and a sea otter savvy program where they do education outreach. They put um, kayakers out on the water when they see people getting too close they just try and educate them and circulate around kind of like they do up at the elephant seal um, rookery up in Piedras Blancas they just let people know what you should and shouldn't be doing so that's been a great program but we still get people getting too close to marine mammals so we just wanted to throw the guidelines out here again and I'll, I'll read them out here quickly um, you know if, if you're doing anything that attracts the attention of the otter you're probably too close it's sort of the rule of thumb most people think that there's a hundred foot or a hundred yard um, minimum distance you can get. There is no minimum distance, there is no maximum distance. It's a distance to which you don't disturb the animal. Um, and if it's raising its head and looking at you and starting to swim away or, or reacting any way, you're probably getting too close, so you need to back off. Um, they need space, uh, they need to rest. Sea otters eat, I don't know what the exact number is, but they like eat their weight in food every 24 hours. Um, they consume an enormous amount of food to keep warm in this cold water and they do a lot of resting. Uh, they're kind of like babies in that way. They eat um, and rest and eat and rest and eat and rest. And um, So you need to give them some room so they can conserve their energy. Um, you can put yourself uh, at risk of being bitten. Uh, I've been near um, fish and wildlife in the past when they've gone into Morro Bay and tagged otters where they go capture them. And I've seen grown men chased out of boats by otters that have brought on board the otter and gotten out of the net and gone wild in the boat trying to escape. Uh, they can get pretty vicious. They're related to skunks and weasels. Um, so they they know how to fend for themselves and they will and, and will inflict a nasty bite. So you don't want to get too close, um, especially mothers and pups. So stay away. They can carry diseases, um, different diseases, some of which are transmittable to humans. So you want to stay clear. And again, wildlife needs to be allowed to stay wild. So enjoy from a distance. Also on the wildlife front, uh, we've had increased shark sightings as we typically do in the summertime months. Seems a little early this year maybe. Um, if you've been watching the news, you've seen a great increase in white shark activity in Southern California, mostly juveniles. Uh, I think it's probably a result of more people being in and around the ocean and paying more attention, but there's also more animals out there. So uh, we had credible sighting on June 7th uh, for a pretty large animal that we did our normal sign posting in about 10 locations. Uh, we're talking internally about revising our shark notification and advising protocol and what we do with the public. We're eventually going to bring some draft provisions through the Harbor Advisory Board at a future meeting here in the not too distant future to um, get your input on it, get public input on it. So we'll look for that sometime in the future as well. Uh, we've been working pretty closely this spring and summer with the Marine Safety Detachment, the MSD, uh, for the Coast Guard down in San Diego, or Santa Barbara. Um, they're our closest MSD on threats to pollute and threats to navigation in our bay. Uh, we've had a few boats that have uh, fit that category here um, within the last few months. One was the Rocky Point and started to sink at the South Tee Pier. We um, required the removal of about 600 gallons of oily water. Uh, the boat had been taken on probably rainwater over the winter and also um, seawater through, through its wooden hull that wasn't in very good shape. So. It, that boat's got the interest of the Coast Guard and us as well, so hopefully we can get that fixed or out of here in one way or another. Uh, commercial fishing boat Calypso wasn't tied up right in the North Tee Pier. Uh, got hung up on a tide and spilled a fair amount of fuel out of a fuel vent. Um, that also attracted the attention of the Coast Guard and us when we had to go in and clean out about 70 gallons of oily water from the bilge and some of the fuel that spilled under the water. Um, so just a reminder, folks, to take care of your boats, make sure they're tied up right and fuel and whatnot is stored properly. Uh, we had some pretty tough enforcement issues to deal with this the last few weeks. Um, we've done some multiple night patrols. Um, we've written a fair amount of citations for some code enforcement issues on the waterfront and had to um, impound the commercial fishing vessel to Point Estero for illegally tying up and non-payment of fees. So um, that's part of the statistics in the, in the beginning where we had 31 enforcement contacts. So guys have been out there on the enforcement front staying pretty busy. We had a collision in the front of the Morbid Yacht Club on about June 26th. Um, completed paperwork there for both parties. Fortunately, there were no major injuries 
um, or loss of property there, but um, those two vessel operators are working it out with themselves, hopefully to um, fix the problem that caused it in the first place. And then um, just today we had uh, Morro Bay Junior Lifeguards. As you know, we run two sessions of lifeguards every year, junior lifeguards every year through our program. Uh, we're right in the middle of the second week right now. Um, so last week and this week we do operations with the Harbor Patrol and our lifeguards were the junior lifeguard folks. Um, kids get on board, they're an age anywhere from 9 to 16, and we teach them about boating safety and water safety and go out and do some fun stuff on the water, but also do some good training with them. So we'll be working with them over the next few weeks. And then there's a break session, in, a week session break in the junior guards, and then they start back up, uh, I think, about middle of July. So uh, look for those kids out on the beach. It's a great program. On the dredging front, uh, Corps of Engineers Hopper Dredge Equina was here through most of the month of May. They removed almost 200,000 cubic yards of material, mostly in the harbor entrance area, but also inside at that um, sand bar that builds up on that inner groin jetty. Um, so they've come and gone. They've done the work they need to do. Um, we had a lot more time with them this year because of the cost of the dredge actually went down this year. So um, we have the fixed dollar amount that we get appropriated from Congress, and when the cost of the dredge goes down, we get more days. So that was good. Um, now they're gone. Um, Atna Marine Bill, or Atna Design Build is back in action with their um, hydraulic dredge. They are done with the area off of the Inn at Bay in the A2 mooring area. They are done with the area off of the North and South T piers, which is what's called the Navy Channel. And they've now moved on out to the Sand Trap area, which is basically between the South Jetty and the Inner Groin Jetty. Um, and it is exactly what it says it is it's a sand trap that trap sand before it migrates over into the navigation channel. So they'll be there for probably another good month um, removing the material they need to remove there. Um, once they're done, they'll demobilize out and then end of snowy plover nesting season, which is October 1st, they're going to have to figure out how to get out on the sand spit and go recover all their pipe that washed ashore there in the middle of winter. So uh, they'll be around for a, while, for a while longer. So you haven't seen the last of Otna. Recent council activity, um, back on the 13th, June 13th, the council um, by resolution approved a two-year lease agreement with the California Fish and Wildlife Department for tie-up for their patrol boat bluefin, which finally got back from a haul out. It's been there for, I don't want to say seven or eight months. Um, so the boat's back and we've got a new two-year contract, so they'll be able to keep using the dock there, which I believe they intend to do. And also on the 13th, the city council adopted all the city's operating and capital budgets um, for the general fund and all the enterprise funds, so we have a budget and we're up and running, which is good because it's July. And then on June 27th, the council reviewed and approved the final versions of the advisory board work plans for this coming fiscal year, the existing fiscal year um, that we brought through the Harbor Advisory Board, I think last in May, might have been April, but I think it was May. Um, didn't really have any substantive changes to our work plans out of the last time you saw it. Um, one of the council's concerns was we, we had the most um, work plan elements, so most to do, most things on our to do list than anybody else. So we took some of them and consolidated and pared them down and, and got the list down a little bit shorter, but we still have a pretty big list, which one of them tonight we're working on paid parking. And then at also the June 27th meeting, um, and this is now um, completed, we, we had conditionally um, done a uh, conditional offer for a um, Interim city manager to Martin Lamelli, Marty Lamelli, um, for interim city manager position since David Buckingham has now left. Um, made that offer. He's gone through background checks. I think he's on his fifth or sixth day at the job now. Um, he's basically here to keep the city running for the next four or five months and work on the recruitment to hire a new permanent city manager. Um, Marty comes from a 20-plus um, year career down in Southern California. I think over, I think it's a 30-year career. 20 of those years, 20 plus of those years in the city of Laverne. Um, he retired to Morro Bay about a year ago, um, has been involved and engaged with the community since then, and when the city needed an interim city manager, he stepped up. So um, we, all the city department heads are starting to work with him and incorporate him into the city team. So if you see him around town, uh, say hi. On the lifeguard front, lifeguards are now on duty seven days per week. They started that over the Memorial Day weekend. Um, several of our lifeguard staff cross over into the junior lifeguard ranks. In other words, they're either instructors or aides with the junior guards, and then they do tower guard duty on other hours. Um, so we've got currently three towers out there. Um, like we did last year, we instituted a tower zero, thanks to the friends at the Harbor Department um, for funding us getting that tower. It's out at the, uh, the outlet for the old power plant outfall. Um, great vantage point. 
just really starting into a good summer season of using it, so we'll see how effective it is, but I think it will be proving its worth uh, as the summer goes on. From the fishing end, uh, free fishing day was July 1st. That's the day you don't have to have a um, fishing license to fish anywhere within the state, no matter your age. Uh, and then they're doing that again on September 2nd. Um, commercial and recreational Dungeness crab season closed the end of June. Uh, we had a little bump for some of the commercial folks here towards the end of June, um, but most of those guys are up in the Bay Area. Um, so you're probably seeing a fair amount of crab pots stacked in the Triangle lot and other empty places as guys slowly bring in. You know, most boats <coughs> that fish Dungeness um, commercially don't stack, can't stack all their gear on the boat at once. They have to, to stage it, so they'll bring it home and stack it, and bring it home and stack it, clean it, and then go take it to their barns or backyards or wherever they stored out of the season as they go repair gear, and then it shows back up here come um, October, November as they go back out. So you'll see that gear laying around. And then salmon season, um, I don't know if Owen, if you want to weigh in anymore on some of the fishing things. Um, salmon season's open. There's been a little picking out here front, out here in front. It hasn't been real good, but you know some of the sport guys have been catching a few fish. And, Commercially, I don't think there's big enough numbers for guys to really be sticking around here, but guys that are here that are fishing commercial are catching a few. I guess salmon season closed for commercial at the end of, of June, but I think sport went is going for another week or so. Okay. That is pretty slow. Yeah, yeah. overall. I think a few guys might have done okay. But. Okay. Uh, on the event calendar, past events, uh, the Moore Bay Museum of Natural History held a number of hikes throughout the town, uh, throughout Moore Bay, um, historical and ecological type um, educational hikes. Those were great if anybody participated in those. Family Fun Day, 4th of July at the park, at Titans Park, um, city-sponsored event and city-run event. That was a great event. We had Police Fire Harbor down there. Um, a couple other agencies had a lot of fun events. I think the turnout was pretty good. Um, so we look forward to doing that again next year. And then status of pending Harbor Advisory Board recommendations. Um, probably go down. Nothing's really changed from um, up to the RFQ on the Marine Services Facility Boatyard, which is about halfway down the page, starting on the recommendation date 3217. The City Council involved the Harbor Advisory Board directly in consideration. And incorporation of Measure D into the general plan and local coastal plan update. Um, that one, along with the ambiguities in Measure D, we are taking that to the City Council next week for the Council's input um, with a recommendation that the Planning Commission um, send over a couple of members to, the, to our Working Waterfront Ad Hoc Committee to work on the Measure D ambiguities and also work on working waterfront type issues as they relate to the general plan, local coastal plan. So that those two bodies, so that you and the Planning Commission are kind of working harmoniously and not on parallel tracks doing the same work. And then eventually whatever recommendations come out of that committee go to the Planning Commission and the General Plan Advisory Committee, the GPAC, to be incorporated in. So hopefully our work here at the HAB will be more um, congruous and harmonious with the Planning Commission and GPAC as it moves into the um, general plan, local coastal plan update processes. And that's all I have on the pending HAP stuff. Any questions for the director? Neil? Not at this time. Bill? Not at this time. Lynn? Uh, only one on the accident between uh, uh, in front of the yacht club down there, it said number one that there were two boats hit. I thought there was only one. You probably know more than I. Was it a yacht club boat? The one that got hit was a yacht club boat, yes. I just wondered if he hit somebody else on his way out. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think uh, one guy, I think the visiting boat was between wind and tide, he got himself sideways and ended up bouncing into somebody else. Oh, must have been down at the other end. Uh, and secondly, the uh, zoonotic diseases from the otters, can you be specific there? Are there some specific diseases the one that, that I am, are? Yeah, the one that I am most aware of is um, called leptospirosis. Oh, okay. Which is some kind of a lung respiratory ailment. Yeah, I just wonder how that would. Yeah, it's probably more out. common 
or maybe more transmittal from sea lions because I think sea lions are more common and around probably get closer to people more often. Mm -hmm. But yeah, leptospirosis is the one I'm aware of. Thank you. Owen? No. Gene? Uh, the only comment I have would be on the sea otters. I continually see people basically in kayaks will come up to an otter that's sleeping or wrapped up around kelp and poke it with, its, with their paddles to see whether it's alive. And I think maybe the kayak rental agencies need to step up and really inform the, the public that, hey, just leave them alone, you know. So. Okay, thank you. And I have one quick question uh, regarding... Uh, the, the last time you gave a report on uh, dredging, you mentioned that the Corps will do a, sort of an after-action survey of the work. Is there any portion of Edna's work where that has occurred, to your knowledge? They've done the post-dredge surveying, which is technically what it's called, for the Aquina, and that's where that um, 198,000... 561 cubic yards came from they, the the dredge estimates because they you know they've got their hopper and they can see how full it gets and so they have a pretty good idea on a daily basis ongoing what their quantities are but they confirm that with pre and post so they'll they'll dredge or they'll survey prior to the the, the aquina coming and get the the depths and the contours and then the, the dredge will come in and do their business and they'll they'll survey it afterwards and and plug it into a computer model and do the math and figure out how many how many uh, cubic yards they move. How about the other contractor? The other con same thing. They'll, it's a two parts to that. They have their own surveyor that they survey as they go to make sure they're getting the areas that they're contracted to do and don't leave somewhere you know, undone because you can only tell so much by, by feel essentially with the dredge. So they'll confirm their own work and then eventually the court comes back in and backfills it and confirms to when it comes down to payment time to make sure that they're, they're paying correctly. So it's a dual process there. Uh, with respect, the department might want to communicate to the core who holds the purse that two weeks ago in the, in the channel, portion of the channel just north of the museum, uh, there were a, there was where what nominally was 20 to 30 feet after dredging, there's a seven foot hump and a nine foot hump in the channel. Okay, moving right along. That brings us to item number, where's our, B2. Oh, here we go, thank you, B2, which is a presentation this evening from uh, representatives of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and uh, we don't know your name, so if you could introduce your team and tell us what you're here, uh, give us a quick overview and then launch out. Great, um, can you hear me? Uh, a, little closer. a little bit closer, okay. Uh, well, good evening, Chair Reisner and uh, board members. Um, I'm Chris Potter, I'm with the California Natural Resources Agency and the California Ocean Protection Council. I'm joined here with um, colleagues from the, Bo the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Thurston, Frank Pendleton, and Susan Zaleski. I'm also joined um, with a colleague from the California Energy Commission, Eli Harding. And I think, I think that covers it. Um, but this evening, I'm going to be giving you a briefing on the, um, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's uh, task force on uh, offshore wind. And um, make sure that this clicker does work. So this task force was launched um, last year at the request of uh, Governor Brown, and um, it was it was during the uh, during the first inter uh, the first uh, task force meeting that uh, we decided to launch a um, a robust. Um, outreach effort and a data gathering effort. Um, so in this presentation, I will be uh, providing information about the, the task force, 
and the state federal gathering, a data gather, gathering effort. Um, we're also seeking your feedback and welcome any questions you may have. Uh, offshore wind is a, a relatively new technology in the United States and it seems to generate a, a great deal of questions wherever we go. He's looking at me to speak into the microphone. Um, so I had mentioned uh, in May of last year, Governor Brown sent the Secretary of Interior, Jewel, a letter requesting that she direct the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, to establish a federal uh, California Marine Renewable Energy Task Force. BOEM, working with the state, held a kickoff meeting on October 13th in Sacramento. The purpose of the task force is to coordinate and collaborate on renewable energy activities on the California outer continental shelf, so that's you know beyond three miles. The task force membership consists of uh, 50 federal, state, tribal, and local agencies and governments. Uh, for example, the California Energy Commission, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Coastal Commission, uh, Navy, Army Corps of Engineers, and the Coast Guard are all members of the task force. Uh, Bruce Gibson, a supervisor from, um, some from the county, is a member of the task force as well. So participating in the task force does not expand the authority of any member agency or official. In a nutshell, the task force serves as a forum to discuss stakeholder issues and concerns, exchange data and information about biological and physical resources, ocean uses, priorities, and to facilitate early and continual dialogue and collaboration. So this slide shows um, BOEM's renewable energy leasing process, which is a multi-year process that follows four basic phases and has just gotten started in California. Uh, the task force is currently engaged in the first phase, uh, planning and analysis, which will take approximately two years to complete. Based on the data and information gathered from stakeholders during the first half of 2017, BOEM in partnership with the state and based on input from the task force at its uh, upcoming meeting in uh, September, will develop, or sometime this fall, uh, will develop a call area to be used in a call for information and nominations for publication in the Federal Register. The purpose of the call is to identify additional information that may not have been previously identified, solicit formal public comments regarding the areas identified, and determine level of developer interest in the call area. So in a nutshell, a call area is a defined geographic area of the outer continental shelf initially identified for potential leasing for offshore wind development. Um, so the state and BOEM, as I mentioned, are currently engaged in an intensive outreach effort culminating with the second task force meeting in uh, this fall. Am I out of sync? I am, sorry about that. Um, in particular, we've been meeting with tribes, fishermen, local electeds, and environmental groups. The purposes of the outreach are to basically identify issues and concerns, inform stakeholders about the goals and activities of the task force, to inform them about offshore wind technology and potential projects, and to involve them in the data gathering effort. The data we gather will be used to inform future decisions, including the identification of one or more call areas, with a special emphasis on the Central Coast. Call areas will be the subject of future environmental analysis and may culminate with a competitive lease sale by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, the task force decided to focus planning and data gathering on the Central Coast for three primary reasons. Uh, one, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory has identified the Central Coast as having sufficient wind resources uh, that is consistent above seven meters per second. Two, there is transmission infrastructure and other infrastructure that could be potentially used to support offshore wind development. For example, the closed Morro Bay power plant and the Diablo uh, Canyon Power Plant, which is slated to be closed by 2025. And last, um, two wind energy developers, as you know, have indicated to BOEM that they have interest in developing uh, a project off the coast of Morro Bay. 
On a broader context, it's worth noting that California has a statutory renewable energy target of 33% by 2020 and 50 by 2030. Uh, to help achieve these long-term energy and environmental goals, the state is exploring emerging technologies such as offshore wind energy that might be able to provide renewable zero carbon energy. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Gene Thurston, who can talk a little bit more about the, the technology and how wind farms work. Thanks, Chris. Let's see if I can get the red Matt, thing to work. Could you repeat your name and the agency that you represent, please? My name is Jean Thurston with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Thank you. So floating offshore wind farms uh, look basically like this. This is a conceptual schematic of what a potential floating offshore wind farm would look like. Wind farms in Europe offshore have been delivering energy since 1991, but they use a monopile type of technology, which is basically uh, what you see on land, that it goes directly into the seabed. This type of technology is different in that it's floating. Because the continental shelf drops off so dramatically, what happens is they cannot put monopiles in those types of depths that you have offshore California. So a developer would have to use a floating type of technology. So this technology is very new and they only have a few of these operating in the world. So I just want to kind of provide that as, as context. This is very um, new in that it's using older type of technologies combined together. So how they work is basically floating offshore wind turbines have generators that use the kinetic energy from wind and convert that to electricity with turbines that are attached to the top of towers, which are attached in turn to a floating type of foundational system. The floating wind turbine system is connected by mooring lines, typically three to four, that connect it to the seabed so they stay in place. Electrical power lines would interconnect each one of the turbines together, which in turn would go to an offshore substation that would convert the energy from the wind turbines to a sufficient power level to export it to the shore using an export cable that can be buried or laid upon the, the seabed. This uh, transmission cable transmits the power to an onshore substation where it is in turn connected to the onshore um, transmission grid, so the regional grid or the statewide grid. So that's basically how they work. A lot is similar to what's done on land, but you have some different similarities because of the fact that it's on the ocean. So one of the things that Chris mentioned earlier is that we've been engaged in a data and information gathering effort in order to determine and identify sites that are suitable for offshore wind development for California and federal waters. We know there's a lot of uses offshore. We know there's a lot of important uses. And what we've been doing with this outreach effort is talking with local communities to learn more and kind of picture what the story is offshore so we can try and limit conflicts with wind turbines and wind farms. So in this process of collecting the data and information, the goal is to identify one or more areas offshore California that would appear to be the most suitable for offshore wind development that has the least amount of user conflicts and the least amount of environmental impact. So that's going to be taking a lot of data and information and trying to balance a lot of different things together. So learning from the local communities about what's important here is really critical in that process. And as Chris mentioned earlier, we're looking at the central California coast for those three reasons of abundant wind resource, the existing transmission infrastructure from Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon, 
and um, developer interest that has already uh, started to happen in this area. So we have what's known as a data basin gateway, which we've developed with the state of California. And the California Energy Commission has worked with this data basin gateway in different projects, uh, in the desert and in uh, the San Joaquin Valley to site different sorts of energy projects. So we're using that experience that California has had and applying that to the federal waters to collect the information in a clear and transparent way so a, a person from the public can look at all of the data that we're collecting and set up an account online and just look at everything that's being collected and see how we're, we're looking at the data to make our decisions in the future about identifying these potential areas. And there's a, a website to where it's, it's linked and um, we have some folks here today that can talk a lot more about databases, but it's just a quick overview. So we've done um, community engagement with the marine community, meeting with uh, ports and fishing communities in the central coast. We met in Santa Barbara, Port San Luis, uh, and here in Morro Bay. And we've been presenting to state and coastwide fishing organizations, such as the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, uh, and the Habitat Committee and the Ground Fish Committees in order to learn more and to reach some of the fishermen that are also from out of state because the Pacific Fisheries Management Council can meet more, more fishermen than just us meeting them locally. And then we've also um, talked with the local communities and learned that safety is important for the fishing community offshore. So we've been talking with the United States Coast Guard to understand any vessel traffic uh, issues and to understand the different vessel traffic patterns. There's a lot of vessels that move from LA and Long Beach and going up to San Francisco that are offshore. And we want to learn and understand that better. Because if an offshore wind farm is sited in one location, that could move vessels from going towards that area to another area and that could impact another user. So we're trying to understand the full picture with the information we're gathering from database. So we've been doing this effort for the past uh, six months. And there's a website, bone.gov slash California, that has a lot more information than I could possibly tell you today. Uh, there's links to maps. There's links to the database and portal. Um, there's information about the Trident Winds project that was proposed offshore Morro Bay uh, in January of 2016. Uh, that started all of this process. So, and if you have any questions, you can contact myself or Chris Potter. Our contact information is listed right there. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. And I think we're going to open it up for questions. And Not quite yet. Okay. So, why don't you uh, have one of your team talk us to us a little bit about the database? Give us an overview of the database, please. Sure. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Eli Harland. I work for the California Energy Commission. Um, as Gene and Chris described, uh, the database in Gateway um, was put together collaboratively with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management as well as um, other task force agencies, so the Energy Commission, um, CDFW. And uh, as Gene mentioned, they, we've used um, a similar gateway structure in other planning processes um, throughout the state. So in the desert, we developed what's known as the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. And in the San Joaquin Valley, we developed a um, lease conflict process to identify areas potentially suitable for solar PV. Um, so all of those, both of those planning processes were um, not citing specific projects, but um, looking at a region collectively um, and being able to identify and balance the variety of conflicts you might um, encounter when you're developing or building projects. So um, the database and gateway is a platform that allows us to um, bring data into a transparent, um, transparent platform that allows folks to be able to 
um, log in and see the types of decisions that are being made and the data that's being used. So um, the link that is on the website here, or the link to the website um, is on the bottom. You can go to the website and uh, create a free account if you'd like to have an account and be able to go onto the database and gateway and create your own maps using the data we're using. Um, you can also access the website and you don't have to have an account if you just want to go on and view data and see that data. Um, if you'd like to collaborate and make maps and do other things, um, that's something you'd have to do uh, by creating an account. So um, we've seen a lot of benefit with uh, developing this type of a platform when it comes to doing planning because constituent groups in different places can log in together as a group and, and create their own maps and share those maps with each other and then share those maps with uh, the public or with decision makers. So I'm um, happy to take questions about the gateway um, if you guys have any now. Neil? Gateway, yeah. gateway yeah. for this gentleman. Yeah, I noticed some dates on here, and you said the data has been collected over six months. Is that time period ceased, and now you're just working with the data you've collected? Or are you guys ongoing? How far into the future are you guys going to be collecting data? Um, so the the gateway will um, it'll be there as long as as long as uh, the database is hosted, and database is uh, it's supported through um, foundation money, so um, it's going to be available forever. Uh, we started with about a hundred sets of data that we had um, already identified that we knew um, we would maybe use in the process, and that was probably been January. Um, since then, we've built the data sets, uh, the database, in up to about 650 data sets, and uh, we're adding a lot less of those um, now. And so we've collected most of the data, and when I say collect, we've identified data that's been um, like vetted or owned by an agency already, and they're identifying the types of data we may use. Um, and then we've also been working with other stakeholder groups to identify data that they may think are useful in the process, and we've been posting it there. So really the next large step is um, going to be looking at that data and finding what's the most relevant data um, for our purposes and what's the most relevant way to kind of consider and use that data. So um, I don't see the, it growing much larger at this point, but um, the next big step is really socializing it and using that, that data with folks. So. so my follow-up question to that then is if I created an account and, for example, I had either a, a business or a use that might have conf I might put together a map and it might conflict with the current map that you guys have, if I want to, say, submit that as a new data point to look at, what would that process look like to get into this database? Um, you can you can do that uh, two different ways. I mean, the first way would be to to create that map and then share it through a, a public commenting process. So if we have an open public comment process where we're collecting information, um, I, what I've seen is really helpful is folks do use it to create a map, and then you know they attach that to comments um, to support those comments. There's also f uh, features within database in that allow you as a user to go in and create a map and, and insert comments on that map. Um, you can point to a specific place, you can draw a boundary, so like a polygon around an area and attach comments to that as well and submit that. Um, since we're not at the point where we're collecting um, specific public comment, we haven't really enabled that feature, but as we start to create maps um, in database, and that will be a feature that um, that will become really helpful for us to be able to communicate with such a large group, a uh, diverse group of stakeholders up and down the state. So, just be Bill, before I get to you, uh, how many folks in the in the audience with us tonight might have questions or comments for Bone? Okay, well that makes it pretty easy. We'll we're going to go down the board first and just to see whether something else comes up that might prompt somebody to have a question or a comment and then we'll get to public comment thanks bill nothing right now you one of the things that you said was uh the word if was attached to uh public input why if 
Um, I, it, when I use the word, if it wasn't, if we collect it, it's, I guess it's when I should have said when we collect it. Um, I know we'll be collecting it, but we aren't in a place where we're representing something that says, tell us what you think about it. And we get to that place, then, then, uh, we will be collecting it. So okay, thank you for the clarification. That's okay. Yep. Lynn. Owen. Hi. Um, so you, you mentioned the task force is made up of all these different agencies. I was wondering why wouldn't PFMC or the National Marine Fishery, Fishery Service like be an important thing to have on the task force? Or um, I, I will let Jean answer that. She manages the task okay. force. So yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Hang on. Let's let, let's keep yeah. going. Let's okay, keep so let's keep going with you first, and yeah. then we'd be happy yeah, to have Gene back. So they, they are on the and the oh. task force is made up of okay. go, of governmental okay. entities. So yeah, you're right. Okay. PMFC and MFS would be okay. um, a governmental body, and it's local, state, and federal, as Gene mentioned. Okay. And I had one one question about the um, the data gathering. Yeah. Um, I I feel it would be real difficult to get accurate representation of actual um, commercial fish importance of certain areas um, since it's so cyclical um, how how back or how far back into the past do you expect to be looking at yeah that so part of our so part of the outreach that um, <coughs> that Gene described um, when we were meeting with different fishing organizations whether it was PFMC or um, even some of the local groups were questions um, regarding that, how do we? Where does the where's the data come from? What should we be looking for? What should that data tell us? Um, at this point, we have posted to the website. Um, we have landings data from CDFW that um, goes from two or 1981 to 2016. Um, we have that map by block, um, and we have that available by the number of pounds landed by block and the. Um, X vessel value reported by block at this point. Um, and we have those maps available in, in different sub gear types is how we've organized um, those maps. <clears throat> We're also working on um, creating data points um, that correlate with those landings data to show um, how that data is displayed by port as well. So not just by block, but by port. Um, we also have been Working um, through uh, our contacts at CDFW have been providing um, certain logbook data sets that we also have available. Those are in different time periods depending on when those logbooks uh, were required to be submitted um, and uploaded. And we also have recreational fishing data um, from the Recreational Fishing Survey and some um, observer data from NOAA's observer program that we have. And at this and at this point, it's uh, most of that data is very raw, and we've created maps and posted it, but we haven't done anything to um, take it and begin to understand where areas are um, uh, have more fishing activity and where areas have less. So, yeah, I guess my thought would be that a lot of commercial fishermen tend to put like a more vague block number, which would be like ten thirty six, would kind of be cover most of what's out here, and, you know, in order to kind of fishermen like to be kind of secretive. <laughs> as you can imagine. So. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that's something we've heard, and so we know that that's um, a limitation with with some of that data that we have, and we we um, are we intend to work with um, fishing groups on looking at that raw data now and understanding how to um, process it and really uh, be able to use it um, within our process. So, Jink. Yeah, I attended the Board of Supervisors meeting when you guys made a presentation, and the uh, um, presentation on BOEM's Access Gateway program seemed to be a bit confusing to most of the people in the, in the audience. Um, is there a YouTube video that could explain how, this, how you implement this, this process? Yeah, so um, the, I don't have that website on here, but the... Uh, the gateway is, what it is, is it's powered by a platform called Databasin. And on the Databasin website, which you can access, or the homepage, um, there's a link in the top right of that picture there. And if you're on that gateway and you select the Databasin website, um, 
from there, you can find a lot of helpful tutorials on how to get started using databasein. There's other tutorials on how to uh, begin to create maps. Um, so all of that is uh, widely available. And I know that there's contact information at the end of this for folks, and so if you get in touch with me, I am more than happy to, um, to be able to walk you through and, and show you how to use um, databasein. It's, uh, it can seem a little, um, it can seem a little overwhelming, and once you get going on database, and you'll see it's actually uh, a pretty simple and powerful way um, to uh, understand pretty complex data. So, at least, at least that's, we're, we we hope that it's that way. Um, so I understand the concept that you're making here, but my question is: is uh, who is the permitting? Uh, agency so let's say let's take this scenario that you have a company Trident or wh whoever who wants to create a wind farm you've analyzed certain things and they say they're going to do it here who makes the final decision I mean it's it, who's the regulatory agency that's going to say you have this permit we have this tr transmission line here at the power plant so you can use that to feed it in wh who makes that decision I mean, is it anyone, the city of Morro Bay, or do they have to buy in toward it, or is it someone besides um, anyone that I know of? I'm just curious. Uh, it, it's a lot of uh, agencies that would be involved from the local, state, and federal level. The proposal that Trident um, submitted, that they submitted that to um, BOEM, because BOEM is the, has jurisdiction for um, leasing the use of those waters uh, for, that, uh, for, the, for that use. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of other agencies that would have to be involved in such a review. So a transmission line would cross into state waters, um, and that would invoke other uh, environmental review and other agencies. So um, it's not just one, it's a, it's a collective. And, I see. Yeah, okay. that's part of why the, the task force is important. And location will matter on whether that would be the city of Morro Bay or if it was in a different place, it would be the city of something else or a county of, yeah. I got you. Okay. Can I jump on and add to that and maybe after question suggest that either Chris or Gene um, kind of hypothetically play out what this permitting process and this, let's assume everything keeps going forward as Trident or Stat Oil move forward and the, and they establish this wind farm, what does the regulatory and permitting process look like? I know it's not exact at this point, you're, you're learning as you go, but if you could spell that out, I think that might be helpful. Actually, the larger question would, would be, what's your critical path? And what are the macro elements of your critical path? And is there any calendar associated with that? But before we get to that, I have one more question about the database. Oh, yeah. What are the criteria? I presume that there's a weighting that goes on, some sort of a scoring process, because in, as part of the coal evaluation. Who decides what the criteria are for the weighting? So the, the, the criteria for individual sources of data and how they're weighed against each other, or? Yes, okay. as, it re, as it okay. relates to as, a, as it relates to a call area, a particular call area. The, so database at this point is mostly existing data. Um, database is not currently being used for making those types of recommendations or decisions to BOEM. And BOEM is really going to be the uh, re entity that's responsible for designating or pointing to a specific call area. Um, the task force is non-decisional, so it will be making those recommendations to BOEM, but BOEM will be the entity who decides on where a call area is um, located. So that criteria is definitely best for BOEM to describe and discuss, um, but I can say that what databasein is helping us facilitate now before we are into that regulatory process is the ability ahead of time to begin to identify any of these potential conflicts and those um, types of those types of um, issues that arise when you're in a planning process like this. 
So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions regarding database? No? Okay. So do you want to come, you want to address the one point that was brought up earlier for us, please? So the question about criteria? No. No, the, the, the question. I've been asking. What? What was someone's question? No. Oh, OK. I guess my question was just, who, like, who from PFMC or, or an emphasis on the task force was the main? Was that so we don't have a representative from the Pacific Fisheries Management Council on the task force. Um, we have an individual that works for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and he is also on the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, and he's also on the task force. But because he works for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and he also represents the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, he can't represent both. So he represents the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so we do not have a person from the Pacific Fisheries Management Council directly on the task force. It's sort of an indirect, because he's a member of a state agency. We, the task force is comprised of federal, state, local, and tribal governmental representatives, because it is an intergovernmental task force. So we don't have any industry people represented on the task force. Okay, or, or NIMFs, but um, it seems like since it's um, federal ground fish and highly migratory fish, you would, it'd be good if there was somebody that was in, in that fisheries management line, right? Yes, we have uh, representatives from the National Marine Fisheries. Oh, you do, okay. Yes, on the task force. Thank you. Specifically, those concentrating with the coast off of California because they're regional. Those folks are regional. They are. They're they're from this uh, this region. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, a couple questions. Um, so, as I understand it, the task force is made up of governmental agencies, and then the stakeholders are everybody else. Um, is the uh, Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen part of the Stakeholders Association? So all task force members uh, and task force meetings are open to the public. Right. So we encourage the local communities to attend the task force meetings, and the public can come at, at any time during those meetings. They cannot participate directly in proceedings, but they can listen and we have a public comment period at, at the end where we have a Q&A session and answer questions and, and take comments. Okay. Um, do you know whether the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Association is part of the task, is part of the stakeholders? Yes, of okay. course. They're, all, all community for the coast of California, we consider to be stakeholders in this process because everyone's tied to the coast. And then I wonder if you can give us a little more detailed information on the offshore moorings, approximately where, how far offshore we're doing, um, how deep a water, and how they're moorings, um, configuration, that sort of thing. So a lot of those particular questions you just asked are really related to a specific type of project. And right now we had a proposed project, but now we're engaging in a planning and analysis stage where we want to identify areas offshore. So we don't know what those moorings would look like. I can I can talk a little bit about conceptually what they would look like and conceptually about the depths, but we haven't identified where these types of projects would go, what specific type of technology they would have, or the specific mooring system. Do we have any idea how many they're proposing or how big they are? I can talk conceptually about it. Okay. Um, average offshore wind turbines are larger than on land. On land, you have two to three megawatt turbines. Offshore turbines are typically five 
to, to up to eight megawatts, and it can actually go beyond that to like 9.5. So these are much larger than what you see on land. The tower height, which would be the, the largest profile that you could see from shore, that would be approximately 400 feet tall. And the turbine blades themselves could get up to, uh, or maybe even a little above, 600 feet. And that's with the current technology. So as time goes on, like 10 years from now, that could be a very different turbine. That could be taller. In existing, um, I, don't, I don't remember the term, but when they're located to the subfloor, um, they're serviced by somebody who has to go out and crawl up inside of them and do the work. That will have to happen also out there. Is that correct? Yeah, there'd have to be inspections. And of, serviced. And, and servicing. Okay. And, and they'd be maintained. Very similar to what's done for offshore oil and gas, that there is a regular inspection system. And then the, the existing offshore moorings that are done, I believe, in, in off of Scotland or somewhere in that area there, and about how deep of water are those, do you know? I don't know how deep the project offshore Scotland is. Uh -huh. I know proposed projects have been um, typically around 800 to 1,000 meters, 1,000 feet, excuse me. Okay. Um, and the Trident Winds project is actually... It's proposed to go even deeper than that. Okay. Thank you. Anything else from the board right now? Guy, yeah, Lynn, go ahead. Yes. Um, so these wind farms are going to happen. You're not evaluating the possibility or the potential for them. You're, so, you're evaluating the location of them. Is that correct? So we had a developer come forward to BOEM last year proposing an offshore wind project, Trident Winds. And that's one of the first floating offshore wind projects that's been proposed in the world. And it was the first one for the West Coast. Our, our office at BOEM represents the Pacific region, so we're responsible for federal waters offshore California, Oregon, uh, Washington and Hawaii, and that was the pro first project proposed for our region. On the East Coast, there's been numerous projects proposed. There have been leases that have been issued, and developers are now submitting site assessment plans uh, in preparation to submit construction and operations plans. So the technology is coming. I think to the West Coast because we have had developer interest. We had a project proposed offshore Oregon and there are developers that are interested offshore the state of Hawaii. A lot of that is in response to renewable portfolio standards issued by states. California's uh, renewable portfolio is increasing. Uh, Hawaii has one for 100% renewable. They currently import a vast majority of their, their energy. So there's a lot of different drivers that are really bringing this to the forefront. So in a way, we're, we're trying to be proactive about the, if the developers are going to come, we need to identify areas that would be the most suitable rather than react. Thank you. Uh, regarding the technology, um, is it apples to apples with the monopod or pillar style to the floating? Um, as far as you mentioned, there are five to uh, up to 9.5 megawatts. I mean, are they the same output energy wise? So, yeah, it's a matter of, it's kind of apples to apples, apples to a little bit of maybe oranges, in that. The floating technology, as I mentioned, is a combination of older technologies that are coming together to have a floating offshore wind turbine. And the monopiles are an older technology from land that was directly applied offshore. And it started back in the 90s in um, Denmark. And so the power output from those turbines is really reflective of where the technology was then. So in the 90s and in 2000, the wind turbines 
were not as high of a power output. Like originally they were around three to, to five. Now they're moving from five to eight. In the future they could, they could move higher. Okay. So they could move up in the amount of energy produced per turbine. What I'm getting at, I guess, is the overall space of the project. Uh, there's got to, I'm not sure what feasibility has been done, if there's like a, a, a lower limit of we need a minimum of X amount to make a project feasible and an upper limit of, you know, regulatory-wise, you know, once you open the gates, are you just saying there can be one everywhere? Or is there some kind of, has any number been, even if it's conceptually been thrown around as to a, a kind of a, a, we need at least 300 of these or, and no more than 1,200 of these units? And No, it's a, it's a matter of how large the areas would be that we would develop in that call area. Mm -hmm. And then as a rule of thumb, it's three megawatt per square kilometer. Okay, thank you. That's just a rule of thumb. Jean, I have one other question. Um, now, you'll be dealing with the offshore area there. Um, are you concerned about the infrastructure, supporting structure that will be happening onshore? No, that's an excellent question. And this is something that uh, Eli referred to before in that the reason why it's an intergovernmental task force is because there's a BOEM lease that would be required for any project in federal waters, but it's going to have to go through state lands through the water portion going to state waters to get to land, and then it's going to have to incorporate into the transmission system. So there's not just one <coughs> permit approval or authorization, there's, there's multiple ones. And so when, when we look at the environmental analysis and for any projects with the California Coastal Commission, it will look at the entire project. <coughs> We're going to wrap this up. Okay. Go, go ahead, but we're going to wrap it up. Okay. So I have three questions, I think, or maybe four questions, and you folks field them however you choose. Uh, in no particular order, um, is part of your evaluation process the potential economic benefit to involve coastal communities? Are there What are the principal current and or foreseen impediments to offshore wind energy development along the coast in the vicinity of Morro Bay? And what is your critical path? Um, so principally as it relates to calendar, I guess, as opposed to your, uh, your achievement points. Critical path being how long it would take to get from, say, identifying an area to... Critical path is a, is a program concept. So you're on a critical path right now. You're somewhere along that critical path, and the end of the critical path would be permit. Okay. Now I understand the context. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'll tackle the, the last one, and then I think for um, the first one relating to socioeconomic impacts, I would refer to um, Susan Zaleski, uh, my counterpart here today, who will be in charge of the environmental review. Sure. So I'll start with the, the first one. This is the, the critical path right here with the four phases of the leasing process. And part of the critical path is planning and analysis, which is talking with people and understanding more about issues and concerns and uses offshore to identify the most suitable areas. The intergovernmental task force is another part of that path um, because all of those permits, approvals, and authorizations that would come together for the overlapping jurisdictions that have authority for the federal, state, and land components will have to work together in order to review these projects. So it begins with planning and analysis. If we identify one or more areas offshore that would be suitable for development, then we would move into identifying that area specifically through an environmental review process the California Coastal Commission would review it for federal consistency, that environmental review. At the end of that process, we would have identified an area for proposed lease sale. The second step for that would be a final sale notice for a lease sale. 
and then we would have a lease sale or auction where we would auction off that call area for a developer or for one or more developers depending on how many areas and what the size of those areas may be. At that point, a lease is issued. That lease does not authorize any construction to occur. It only allows a developer to submit a plan to BOEM for site assessment activities of how they plan to survey the area to determine where they would microsite each one of the turbines within that area. After a five-year term of doing survey work, they would provide BOEM a construction and operations plan. That construction and operations plan would undergo an environmental review, which would include um, consistency with the Coastal Zone Management Act and the California Coastal Commission. That would be a NEPA, as well as, from what I understand, a CEQA document, probably a joint document, because you have so many agencies that would have to work together for this. At the end of the construction and operations plan's environmental review, the plan would be approved, disapproved, or approved with modifications, and then a developer may begin construction. A lease term is for a 25-year term. Before construction can occur, a developer must provide financial assurance in the form of bonds or other financial assurance information to cover any decommissioning of that project, and that would include the full, the full project. That was an outstanding answer. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Excellent, excellent answer. <laughs> Any concept of time? This is an iterative process, and each phase depends on how long it takes for us to get to the next phase. So the planning and analysis phase, we mentioned a six-month process to try and identify call areas and collect data and information and we're going to be going beyond that. So after, I would say that's going to take at least until the end of the year. And then the leasing process with those lease sale notices, we have to do an environmental review first. So you wouldn't have the environmental review process done for at least, I'd say, two years from now, which takes you to a lease sale or auction. That process would take about a year with a five-year lease term. I mean a site assessment term. So the soonest you could see steel in the water, probably around 2025. About a seven year, seven to 10 year process, sir. If it all works smoothly. If it all works smoothly. Okay, that's great, thank you. Thank Perfect, you. thank you. And ma'am? Hello, I'm Susan Zleski. I'm a biological oceanographer with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and I'm the environmental lead for uh, offshore renewable energy projects. And your question was about socioeconomic issues? Is that... Economic. Oh, economic. Okay, so economic issues that would be analyzed uh, in our environmental document under the National Environmental Policy Act. And so that would fall under our uh, socioeconomic section within that document. And that document would also be a joint document with the state of California under the California Environmental Policy Act. So it would be a joint NEPA CEQA document where we would uh, analyze both the uh, uh, positive and negative potential impacts of these projects. Where along the development, the project developmental path, would a citizen of Morro Bay be able to learn what this interagency process had identified as the potential economic benefits to Morro Bay for having a wind farm off the coast of Morro Bay? That's a good question. Um, so. That would come once, yeah, once we do have a project. So uh, we could lease an area and there would be an environmental analysis and economic analysis would be a smaller portion of that likely for uh, leasing an area offshore. They would do site assessment plan and then they would come in with a construction and operations plan. And that's really where you understand what 
the what's going to happen from the very start of it with infrastructure on shore and and bringing things out and putting steel in the water all the way down through decommissioning and, and what those economic impacts would be. Right now, we can speculate, but it's, it's really hard to know what that will be until we have a construction and operations plan. We do have a, a research study that was funded with the, uh, that we funded through the National Renewable Energy Lab that looks at um, economics along the coast um, and potential job generation from these projects. And then we also have another project that uh, looks at infrastructure, port infrastructure, and uh, what we have onshore existing and, and how much would it take to be able to uh, support these projects and bring them offshore. And that can be found through our uh, boom.gov backslash California website. There's a link to research related to California, but you could contact any of us and we could get you that information. Okay, thank you. So, Chris, I suspect that as all this settles into the community and to the board that we're going to have additional questions. Right. So looking forward, uh, I think it would be very helpful to have uh, Bowen back at some point in the future that it thinks where it's far enough along that it would be meaningful uh, for you folks and meaningful for the community. And I would invite you to let us know when you, ahead of time when you think that is so we can agendize you. And I really, really, really appreciate all of you coming here tonight. That's a big effort. And, Thank you. And, I, and even though there aren't a lot of folks, and we're going to get to public comment before in just a second here, there aren't a lot of folks here tonight expressing an interest in public comment. I can tell you that there was a lot of interest in social media. Locally. Really? Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting to know. Yeah. Um, well, we'll continue to, I will continue, and in, in, I, I speak for my BOEM colleagues too, that we'll continue to be in contact with Eric and have him kind of you know, put his finger in the air for us. And, so, yeah, you should count on us coming back in the very near future to That'd provide an update. And perhaps, uh, I, I, I think Eli would probably agree that um, probably the next best opportunity is when we have information that um, we could um, display through the database, for instance. Sure. Okay. Well, we're very grateful. Thank you very much. And I'm going to open Thank it up you. to public comment. If you have public comment, uh, please approach the podium, give us your name and whatever's on your mind. Hi, I'm Diane Plan. I live in North Morro Bay, and um, I don't really know much about all of this. I watched, a, I watched on YouTube a little video about it with the Trident, uh, the people that own it or whatever. Um, but my questions to them and whoever can answer is, is there any um, effect on marine life? I mean, they may have, met, may have answered that before I got here because I just got off work at 6. Um, but I'd like to know, and a lot of us would like to know, if there's any effect on marine life. That's number one. And the other thing was how much fishing area would be closed, if any, for our friends that are fishermen in the area and fisherwomen. Um, and how far out will they be if we're to go boating? Are they going to be further out than what most people would go on a day trip? Or would they be something we would be able to see from land? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Boehm, just, just a minute, sir. Let's let Boehm respond. Great, so those are uh, great questions. And um, in terms of impacts to marine life, and actually a lot of your questions, we won't know the specific impacts until we actually get a construction and operations plan um, where we can analyze it and have all of the specific details. But the things we're looking at are uh, seabirds, marine mammal migration, uh, fishes, essential fish habitat, uh, endangered species. So we're definitely gonna be looking at all of that um, and people have raised various issues in terms of concerns with bird strikes and marine mammal entanglement. Uh, so those are all, all issues that we're going to be analyzing once we get a project proposed. Um, and so it's very important to bring up these, these issues to make sure that we don't miss anything when we're doing that um, environmental analysis with the documents. 
In terms of fishing grounds, if anything is going to be removed, uh, again, we won't know specifically until we receive a project. And then, so far, right now, the only project we have in the United States is off of Rhode Island, and there was fishing restrictions when they were installing the jackets for the wind turbines, but right now there are no restrictions around those turbines. However, those are bottom founded and uh, into the seafloor and these will be floating. So we'll have to see where they are and then how could that uh, be a negative impact in terms of what gear different fishermen are fishing with. So, um, so there's some things we can speculate on, but it's hard to answer the questions until we have a specific construction and operations plan and know where these would go. Does that answer everything? And, and no, she asked also, she was interested in how far out it might be. Oh, how far out, right. So the, um, at least the proposed Trident Wind Project is uh, 22 miles offshore. Uh, so it's definitely gonna be uh, further than three miles. The wind is better. 10 to 15 to 20 miles offshore. Um, so that's kind of the range that we're seeing right now. Uh, but again, we're, we're not, we don't have the specific area yet. Okay, thank you. Sir? My name is, my name is Mark Hammerdinger. I'm a commercial fisherman out of Port San Luis. And uh, I don't really, <laughs> You know, see any problem with renewable energies? You know, wind is fine. You know, I'd like to see electrogravitics or something, you know, phenomenal. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, and, and, sh and Susan was just saying that it, it would be, you know, 10 to 20 miles offshore. That's not going to affect me. I work currently work in Boeing Conception right now. But, but I do have a question for these people. Uh, as Chris Potter here, he said he said he has our landing data. Uh, who are you gonna who are you gonna sell it to, Chris? I can 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 I buy that landing data from you? I thought my fishing locations and how much I catch there was confidential. Who do I contact to find out where all that money is? Isn't it highly illegal for fish and game to sell my private rights to that data? Uh, just, uh, just a point. I think it is illegal for them to be selling, selling the rights to my fishing spots, how much I make on those spots. And uh, see, we, you talked about, uh, they talked about task force versus stakeholders. In the past, my past experience, stakeholders have always been left out of the equation. Uh, so if, if, if ele uh, electrogravitic technology, some other technology comes in, then uh, when this te technology becomes available, these wind turbine generators would become obsolete overnight. And uh, does electrical flux around the water, I mean, around the, 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 the cables affect the fish or water temperature? Where all those, uh, and where are all those contracted work boats going to be staged, manned, and loaded? And there was one other thing. Uh, I could have sworn that I heard Susan uh, say that that they're not going to keep the economic impact data is, is am I am I correct there I, 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 I you might have misspoken sir why don't you finish your questions and then we'll let these folks address whatever they'd like to and you yeah and that, 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 that and, finishes and, it okay great thanks okay thanks thank you So we'll do an economic analysis, and so we'll have all of that data within the environmental document when we do the analyses. And um, I don't know if Eli, do you want to speak to Eli will come up and speak to the fishing landings data. Uh, yeah, the 
the landings data that um, CDFW has provided us um, isn't individual um, fishermen or fisherwoman data. Um, this data is aggregated um, by block, by year, and so it shows those blocks, it shows the data per block, but we don't have individual information for um, a, a, a fleet or even um, an individual boat, so um, yeah. And it's and the data that, that CDFW has provided for us um, is all publicly available data, and that's the data that we're using in this process, so we're not pulling in any confidential data. All righty, any other public comment? Rick Sauerwein, 1301 Little Morrill Creek Road. And I just have uh, some questions for Susan about the uh, NEPA sequel process. I'd like uh, some clarity on who the lead federal agency is for NEPA, as well as the uh, California agency that's leading CEQA. And based on the presentation, I'm understanding that there'll be a programmatic EIS, most likely, uh, before the leasing goes out. And so I'm curious to know how soon the scoping meeting will be for that. Thank you. Yeah, those are all great questions. So the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, my agency will be the NEPA lead. And right now it looks like the California State Lands Commission would be the CEQA lead. And yes, there are two environmental reviews. One environmental review is with uh, lease issuance, and then the next one would be, would be construction and operations. And so as soon as we uh, go into site assessment um, and area identification, sorry, area identification, that's when we would start the uh, scoping, so public comment period uh, for the uh, NEPA process. Okay, thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, we'll close this item and go back to the agenda. Thank you again. Oh, sorry. How you doing? My name is Jesse Campos. I have a couple questions about the. Uh, you are from where, sir? Uh, Tascadero. So, um, I had a question about the actual uh, turbines. It was kind of. I was curious to see if there, if your information out there running DC back to shore. Can you address the mic, please? They can hear you. If uh, they're running DC power back to shore, I was uh, curious about that. Also, I was concerned about this. This. Uh, it seems like they're kind of tied to this floating system, and. Uh, I was wondering if that's the you're, you're thinking that maybe you might not want to be past a uh, thousand feet offshore or depth wise, and so I was kind of wondering about the uh, turbine if uh, we're, if they're going to be like American made uh, turbines if they're uh, who's who's like I'm pretty sure that this turbine is the system that they're going with, but I was curious about what what kind of product that we're really getting out from the coast that we're having. So that's pretty much it. Okay. The, just a second, sir. Let, let Boehm respond, okay? And we're going to wrap this up. So we got one more. We'll take one more and then we got to move on with our agenda. Thanks. Okay, the question about AC versus DC, what type of power source that it would be, it would depend on the project and it would depend on the turbine that they use. Um, most of these turbines are AC turbines on the market. However, at the offshore substation, they can convert it to DC if it's a long distance to shore. So it depends on where the call area would be, whether it was AC or DC. In response to the other question about would they be American-made manufacturer or European manufacturer turbines, both US and Europe make offshore turbines. The majority of them are made in the European, European Union. Um, if there was enough projects in the United States, probably one of those companies would come to the United States and manufacture them here. So we don't know the answer to this question yet, but just for context, there are U.S. and European. Mr. Parker, would your, would your folks be willing to, uh, we really are getting kind of crunched here in this, uh, on a presentation item as opposed to an agendized item, would you folks be willing to step outside 
and spend a few minutes with anybody in the audience who would like to ask questions. Is that okay with you? That would, that would be great. Sir? This, this gentleman right here? No? Okay. So, so you have an open invitation to chat with these folks uh, at your convenience right outside? No, let them come up. Oh. I was going to come up. Okay. I, I'm not trying to close you out. Don't go away. You got your chance. All righty then. Okay. We're going to move on. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Okay, that takes us to item C1, which is an update from the Marine Services Facility Boatyard Ad Hoc Committee. And that chair is not here. Is there another member of the committee who can speak to that? Seeing none, we'll move on. Mr. Chairman? Sir? If I may indulge you. Um, I met along with um, with Dan McClish and Larry Newland from the Maritime Museum and a couple of representatives from a fairly prominent California engineering firm that is expressing interest in this project. Um, they, they were the engineering end of it that have experience in similar projects and other waterfront and port and harbor development projects. Um, so they came to us last week getting an overview of the project, um, picking our brains a little bit and they're going back and doing a little more homework to see um, part of their business is going out and, and seeking construction and other operational type folks that maybe want to partner with them. So we are seeing a little bit of interest, which is good. So um, hopefully that will come to some fruition here. Okay. Well, is that the only interest so far? I mean, July, uh, July 14th is around the corner. Next we week. had interest early on from a couple other boatyard operator parties, but so far, and Dana has been, um, over the last three weeks, um, Dana and Lori from our office have done an additional layer and level of outreach to other folks and other entities, and Dana has been recontacting everybody that we know that has the RFQ right now, so I don't know what other information he has from those folks directly, but he's actively working on that. Anybody else on this one? No? Okay. Thank you. All right. So C2, update from the Finance and Budget Ad Hoc Committee. Mr. Maloney? Well, we have not had a meeting since uh, the last Harbor Advisory Board meeting, and I don't have anything to report at this time. Okay. Thank you. Anything else from the board on that item? Okay. C3, update from the Eelgrass Ad Hoc Committee. Ditto. We have not had a meeting and have nothing to report. Okay. Thank you. C4, Marine Sanctuary Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, the committee has nothing new to report and unaware of any activity beyond what we reported most recently. So C5, update from the Working Waterfront Ad Hoc Committee. Gene? I think we'll wait and see what the, the city council has to say, and we'll wait for we'll have to schedule a meeting with the planning commissioner. Okay. C six consideration of issues regarding paid parking on the Embarcadero and adjacent vicinities. So we'll open that one up to public comment first. Do we see any public comment? Please identify yourself and uh, tell us what you have on your mind. Thank you. Diane Flynn from North Morrow Bay, and um, my question is, what are the adjacent areas? Um, the only one I think that this will really impact are the small businesses that are not, you know, as busy as they'd like to be already. So, I mean, it won't hurt me, it won't hurt a lot of people in the community, but I'm worried about a lot of my friends that have businesses on the Embarcadero or close to, you know, by like Mike's Barbershop, places like that. Is the parking going to extend up there? That's my question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that having participated in the formation of this agenda item, basically it's the area below the slope. So east and west sides of Embarcadero. Okay. Any other comment? Okay. Seeing none. Mr. Director. Staff report. Thank you. So, um, 
as you know, this was a Harbor Advisory Board work plan item, and it's also an item that um, one of our council members, Mr. Robert Davis, has wanted to move forward with the, with the Harbor Advisory Board as well for consideration. Um, the concept of paid parking along the Embarcadero. Um, I think our, our commenter's question about what do the adjacent areas mean, um, or what is the adjacent area uh, as defined, I think that could fit right in with um, what we're doing tonight, which is essentially identifying the issues at hand with considering paid parking within Morro Bay. Um, we would definitely wouldn't be the only body um, working on this. The Planning Commission as well as the Public Works Advisory Board both have on their goal um, objective agendas to work on this issue as well. So it's likely going to morph into a joint effort, much like the Working Waterfront Measure D, to make sure that we're both on the same path and not working um, on the same thing and, and duplicating time or working against each other on things. So we'll see how that um, plays out. But I think, again, back to the comment, I think that is a good type of input that we're looking for is, you know, what are the issues to address, why, and you know, what things do we need to consider in addressing those, and, and the, what does the Embarcadero and adjacent areas mean, a definition of the area we want to consider. So I'd, I'd throw that back at you to something as an item to consider. Um, so we're just not here to debate deeply, I don't think. I think that's follow-on steps with, with both our body and Planning Commission and Public Works Advisory Board and eventual City Council. I think our first step here is to identify what potential issues are out there to consider. Um, why do we want to consider those things? Why are those things important? In the discussion section of their um, staff report, I gave an example of one item, one issue to discuss. Um, and my example is there will be cost to implement and manage and enforce paid parking. So that's the issue. The, why is it important? Because the revenues must exceed costs um, on some sort of reasonably amortized basis. Otherwise, you're not going to throw money at something that doesn't um, at least break even. And then what are the things to consider? Well, there's capital costs, there's general fund versus harbor fund revenues and costs. How do those get split up? So that's the kind of input we're looking for. Um, just sort of a first list of items. And it certainly um, could be a long list. I don't expect we'll identify absolutely every issue. Um, but hopefully we'll get a good number of them as we move forward into the process. I'm sure those issues will uncover other issues. Um, so these things, as we, as we identify a list, things will be forwarded into the Planning Commission and Public Works um, advisory bodies um, for further consideration. Eventually things will probably get routed back to the Harbor Advisory Board, maybe for further consideration, but eventually it goes to the City Council um, to present it as a holistic um, proposal or project or idea to see where the City Council wants to take it after all this public input is taken. Um, so with that, I will stop talking and bring it back to the board for you folks to deliberate and see where you want to go with it. So our mission uh, as, the staff, as the agenda item describes board is to identify issues for consideration with regard to paid parking and it says on around the Embarcadero, um, we, I, I might suggest we could say waterfront, uh, but as Eric quite correctly points out and, and Ms. Plain points out, we need to define the relevant area. And that's probably, um, or at least our thoughts. We don't need to define it. We need to give them our thoughts about that. And then why the issues that we identify are important um, so I've provided the Harbor Advisory Board with what information uh, I could identify regarding the, uh, the historic consideration of paid parking in the area that we're targeting on. And uh, I'll start with Neil and put you on the spot. Okay. So have you been able to consider what you think might be some issues? relative to the concept of paid parking? Uh, yeah, do you want me to rattle them off or go one at a time? Absolutely. Okay, so, um, you know, as a leaseholder, I've been thinking what are the effects going to be on actual leaseholders and their businesses on the waterfront? I think that's an important discussion. I don't necessarily have the answer for that. Uh, deciding zones, if it's going to be, if there's going to be free zones or if it's all going to be charged, um, paid parking. Uh you know, if there's some kind of permitting allowance for leaseholders or employees, as I drive the waterfront early in the morning, I can, before anybody's walking on the streets, I can tell where employees are already starting to park and 
you know, is there some need for the idea of thinking of along with paid parking, but also permitting for either locals or local business owners, boat owners, stuff like this, um, or there's some flat fee. Um, and then determining a baseline for our current spaces, how many, how much, what's our capacity? What do we actually right now offer? If you're a visitor here, how many spots do we have for you to park on the Embarcadero? And um, is that also the most effective layout? If we do go to paid parking, is there a way to, you know, are the spots t two feet too long and could, or are they, you know, too short? Is this, if we're going to start charging people for spots, we have to give them, you know, a proper parking spot. And then, um, Oh, I had a second one. I just another another one that escaped me. It'll come back to me. So that's my start. That's great. Thanks, okay. Bill. So I think the first question that comes to my mind is why we would why would we consider paid parking? Is it a revenue generating issue? Simple as that. And if that's what it is, then then we should look at it as that. I mean, it's not been defined, and so I think we need to define why are we doing this. Um, I did, thank you, Ron Reed, uh, some of the background that you provided for us. This has been studied, you know, paid parking, more paid structured, uh, you know, a structure somewhere in the Embarcadero. It's been designed in 1993 to have a three-story structure east of the South T Pier. Um, you know, these are all been studies that have been studied since 1993. In all the studies that I've seen, there really isn't a parking problem. It's it's just basically, why would we consider par uh, paid parking? If it's revenue generating, then we need to just make that as being the, the main mission. And then how do we accomplish that goal? Okay, so what I might suggest for a format is that we just go down and initially each of us share their individual thoughts, and because I'm just going to be, I'm sure there's going to be some replication, and then we go back and discuss them, or if that's okay, is yep. that all right? Okay, Lynn. Yes, a couple of things that came to my mind is one: how are you going to uh, collect this paid parking? Is it going to be? Uh, a parking lot that somebody drives into and pays at the kiosk, similar to what you do down at uh, Tidelands, but a closed area. And or is it going to be a parking meter? And it's always return on investment. How much are you going to gain by doing that? If it is time limiting to the customers who are wandering up and down, uh, how much are you going to lose? Because they have a time limit and therefore will not spend as much time, ergo as much money, um, on the Embarcadero. Thank you. Owen? Yeah, so I was thinking about the same thing, the time limit limiting issue that people will go out to dinner and then they'll go to shops and they'll just walk around and, and if they're worried about running back to their car, then that could certainly affect businesses, right? And then also, what you might end up if there's a whole bunch of free parking at one end of the Embarcadero, everybody's just going to park there and walk the other way, at least, you know, except during the very busy times. Um, so unless you had paid parking everywhere, most of the year people are going to try and park in the free parking, right? Would be my thought. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I'm thinking of myself, I guess. I'm just cheap. <laughs> Anything else? Um, no, that's off to start. Okay, Gene? Um, I was thinking perhaps um, it could be a, a phased in project. We have some city parking lots and maybe those could be um, metered areas. Uh, my other question is who's going to be operating, who's going to be collecting the money? Is it the city general staff is working it or is it Harbor Department? And then that brings in a whole new employee plus benefits and it's a uh, it's uh, uh, at least an eight-hour job, so there's seven days a week. So that brings the full employment. Um, and then does the triangle lot become a paid parking area also? So those are my questions. Okay. And aside from the, uh, the common things that we've identified here, uh, just a couple of comments. I'm not making a point, I'm just providing information. 
uh, on July 4th at 11.30 a.m., there, there were no cars in the Triangle lot. On July 5th at 12.30 p.m., there were no cars in the Triangle lot. And the parking on the opposite side of Embarcadero, Gafco, Harbor Hut was slammed. And the street as well. Another data point, uh, looking for communities that are, that have a very strong tourist component that are on the water, the uh, waterfront communities. Santa Cruz has a parking program, paid parking program, and uh, Pismo Beach has a paid parking program. Pismo's is interesting in that they have identified particular parking areas, not street parking. It's, it's sort of off street, if you will, lot lot parking. Uh, Santa Cruz has done it differently. They have a combination of both. So. Um, I like Bill's point. That's a f foundational point. Why should there, if there should be, why should there be paid parking in the area of the waterfront on Morro Bay? And if there shouldn't be, why shouldn't there be? So I don't know, I don't want to get into a round robin thing, so I'll, if it's okay, I'm just going to go right back down the row again and get your thoughts. Gene? Should there be paid parking, and if so, why? And if there should not be paid parking, why? In the past, we found that it's been, um, it didn't pay for itself. We've looked at it a number of times. Um, I believe there should be paid parking in the off-street parking lots. And uh, below the slope? Yeah, and particularly the downtown area of the Embarcadero. Um, probably not the Triangle lot. That would create more people to park over there. But that area that's down below Dorans and that area through there is a should be a paid parking lot area. And that would be a good test to see how it works out. Okay. Owen? Um... I'm not completely decided, but um, should there be paid parking or shouldn't there be and why? Should there be paid parking and if so, why? Should there not be paid parking and if not, why? <laughs> yeah, so I, I would tend to think no because as you mentioned, like it's, it, it, lack of parking hasn't been a, a major issue and the cost uh, the report you sent out, I think it said it would it would require 175 percent of a full time salary. Basically, it would basically require two full time employees, and it seemed to me, and that was it. I think two hours a day per meter, um, and I can't remember how many meters, but and it was it was gonna it would break even. But to me, it seemed like they're being pretty optimistic about the the occupation rates of the parking spots um, and with the caveat that I guess as Gene was saying in that area below Dorns that seems to have a lot of congestion maybe maybe if it was to happen that starting very small in those really high impact areas would be a good way to go that's it Lynn? Um, I guess I'm sort of repeating what I already said, but it's very much going to depend on what is the cheapest you can get away, what method of collecting the money is the cheapest that you can get away with. If it's putting in a parking meter that is functional from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. or 9 p.m., um, then people just keep feeding the meter and you only need a guy to come through for a few minutes every morning or maybe not even every morning and collect the money. Um, for parking meters you don't I believe really need two full-time employees. If you have a man sitting at a kiosk collecting the money then that is a very different situation. So since this is under the goal of achieve economic and fiscal sustainability I thought that 
it was uh, the only reason to put in paid parking is because it's going to pay. It's going to be revenue generating for those cars. Um, and so then the only reason, then the only, the questions become what is the method that you're going to use to maximize the revenue? Bill? You raised it. What's your position? Um, I think we should have paid parking in the Embarcadero, but before we do have that, uh, I do like Gene's idea. We have a enclosed lot, and I think it should be implemented um, to try it out and see how it works. Now, what is the method? I don't know the answer to that. I think that needs to be studied. What's the cost if it's a capital parking meter? How much does that cost? How much would it cost to obtain the money? And what's the ROI on that as opposed to a little key sock and having someone there full time? And we just need those studies. But I think that's a good area to start on and do. I, I'm a firm believer in getting something done instead of studying it. Now, given that statement, you know, we did ask the last meeting has the Embarcadero business owners been consulted with this or do they have any thoughts on this? And I think that needs to be done, too, before anything needs to get, get done. Um, and they, they should be, dis you know, there's 32 leaseholders, I believe, is what Lori told me. And we need to make sure that they put some input in there and they get asked that same question. Should there be paid parking in the Embarcadero? Yeah. Um, I too believe there should be paid parking on the Embarcadero, and that stems from the financial financial aspects right now of the waterfront. I I would say I would that caveat to that is that this paid parking then directly benefited the waterfront, meaning that it went to our fund and not the general fund. Um, and yeah, it might create another job. Uh, it might, there might be some enforcement needs, some ticketing. Uh, tow companies might get some business out of this. Uh, you know, they could. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that might be ran through the Harbor Department if the funds then come to them as well. Um, and phases, I'm, I'm all for that, whether it be a lot or, or street parking. Um, I think technology now is such that you can really I've been paying attention to parking so much more now that we've started talking about this. Everywhere I go, uh, you know, for dinner time, park in the meters in San Luis Obispo stop at 6 p.m. You don't have to pump any quarters on Sunday. They don't start till two. Um, there's spots in in San Luis Obispo when you use your credit card or debit card, it's it charges you for the first 25 or 30 minutes. When I go to Santa Monica and you swipe your card, it charges you two dollars right away with the maximum. It just gives you that option, and then you have to hit negative to go down. But if you're not paying attention and you're in a hurry, you swipe your card, they get an automatic $2. Uh, so then you could also do longer-term parking. Your kiosk can allow you to park for five hours or eight hours. If you want to do all-day parking, you get a discount. I'm not going to go on and on, but just the technology, I think, allows you now to remove people from having to collect the cash. And most of the times now it's plastic cards getting swiped. And if there is an economical way to do it where we start <coughs> phasing it in, put a kiosk in a parking lot that uh, we can utilize now and let that start paying out for the next kiosk in the next parking lot, I think if we have a phased approach, maybe um, you know roll it out as needed. But I think something also, like Bill said, needs to get done sooner than later. If, if this is the decision we make, um, I would like to see something happen sooner. And those funds then go to the harbor fund. Thank you. And my answer to that one particular question is that I think that there's a reasonable opportunity to generate some revenue uh, with some sort of a paid parking plan in a, a highly used and highly trafficked area. Uh, there are any number of models, existing models in waterfront communities that have been able to do it without uh, adversely impacting, apparently, I don't have any data, apparently, because they still have it, so I'm assuming that they haven't adversely impacted the local economy. Uh, insofar as the uh, point about uh, polling, if you will, the leaseholders, or the it wouldn't be just the leaseholders, it 
potentially could be the businesses on the east side as well, and there are some of those. Back in 2003, I don't know what, what the process was, I don't know how it all happened, but uh, there is a letter dated January 26 to then uh, Mayor Yates and the council, and uh, from uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, from 10 uh, business owners between Beach Street and the intake building. Apparently there was some discussion about what to do with parking in that area. And then there was a staff report uh, for council meeting agenda item number A7 on March 24th of 2003, where there was a proposed resolution uh, for a parking plan in that area. Didn't involve money. What it involved was limiting the amount of time in, in various areas. And, uh, and I was down there today looking around and I don't see any signage about that, so apparently in the last 14 years um, that has not been terribly uh, much to concern to people. So um, th the con what I heard was a sort of a consensus that, um, that paid parking might be a reasonable thing to look at. What I heard was that uh, from three of the board members, and I happen to agree, so that's you know four of us. I'm not suggesting a more majority. I'm just saying uh, that it could be approached from a phased standpoint based upon feasibility. Uh, I think it's very important to involve uh, the leaseholders. Or excuse me, I'm going to say the the business people especially in the, quote, downtown, unquote, area of Embarcadero on both the east and west sides, get their input. And so here are, uh, here is the list of things that I wrote down while you were talking, and some of them which we already had. So this issue involves the city's downtown waterfront strategic plan, the city's economic strategic plan, and the waterfront master plan. So it's, there's lots of pit, lots of moving parts to this. Uh, it, the issue requires balancing the opportunity for revenue from paid parking with the needs of business and with tourism. Given the possibility of paid parking in and around the water from business district, how best to provide transportation to a free triangle lot overflow parking? Um, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you Owen are willing to hike the half a mile that it takes to get from the Triangle lot to downtown. Um, that's why I took the opportunity to talk about how many people I saw parking in the overflow lot on, on in July you know, four and five. Yeah, but but I do. But I think that's an important element. Um, I think that the Triangle lot could be incorporated into a parking plan if, in fact, uh, certainly during the tourist season, the the trolley uh, path which is already there, but the trolley path included that as a specific, uh, as a specific item. Um, there will be, I think, continuing impacts on waterfront area parking from business, business property development between beach and marina. I think we have to think about that. And oftentimes that business development seems to incorporate some significant number of in parking in lieu slots in the past that were granted uh, and the because the city is so focused on revenue producing it looks like the city planners are willing to consider um, parking in lieu as opposed to physical parking for increased business activity on the waterfront which means more impact on the existing parking that's there and I think that seems to be a trend that we can probably think will continue to some degree. If there's paid parking is instituted, specifically where would it be located? You folks talked about that. If paid parking is instituted, would there be free parking in the same area? And if so, why, how much, and for how long? If paid parking is instituted, which would be hourly, which would be daily, what would it be? If it's instituted, how much would a reasonable parking fee be? for when? If it's instituted, what will be the means for collecting the fee? You folks talked about that. 
if it's in instituted, would there be an would there be enforcement? And one of you talked about that. And if so, by whom? Uh, would permit parking be incorporated into this? And then Neil was uh, quite correctly pointed out several of the different user groups to include residents, just residents. I mean, that's another possibility. Residents get some kind of a permit. Um, and then I like the question of what's the visitor parking capacity now? I like the point of optimizing visitor parking capacity. And um, I did a little bit of prowling around on the internet about devices. Meters are out. Nobody's doing meters anymore. People are doing kiosks. And there's any number of companies that apparently provide solar powered standalone kiosks and they don't take cash and as Neil pointed out lots of folks don't use cash anymore I mean how many people have you seen buy a pack of gum with a debit card lots lots you know, so maybe you don't have to do cash and we have one kiosk in town Eric do we not we do long tramp okay and tell us just a little bit about that when, when did it go in? How much did it cost? And is it is it revenue positive? That net, net revenue positive went in over the period of about 2008 through 2010 through development and public input and just getting it okayed by the city council. I think it actually went in in spring of 2010. Uh, we estimated 20,000 a year in annual revenues based on our launch ramp usage. We exceeded that in the first year at about 25,000. It's been steadily climbing. We're currently at about 27, 28,000 a year. As I recall, the machine's installation, the, the purchase of the machine was 15 or 18,000 dollars, and we've done some upgrades to it over the years. So, yeah, we've probably got 20, 25,000 dollars into the capital end of it, and there's ongoing subscription costs per year, but. Over the seven years that it's been implemented now, it is on a positive cash flow basis, even including um, staff time to monitor. It's fairly low policing time because everybody gets it, and it's only 40 spaces, and it you know takes us 20 minutes to half an hour to police it down there, even if we have to write a ticket. So it works pretty well. Um, those monies are uh, set aside, uh, you know, earmarked for going back into that lunch ramp facility. Um, as they will continue to be, so um, it's been a positive for us. Okay, thanks. And that's you just that last thing is another point that you folks brought up, which is um, I think Neil, you said you wanted to see 100% of the revenue go back into the waterfront, waterfront infrastructure. Or did you mean specifically 100%, or did you mean some significant? theoretical portion I think that if the city yeah, if the waterfront and the harbor department is managing and operating them then that should be a hundred percent reclamation on that it's, as it will affect those businesses heavier than any other businesses in the city uh, if the city was going to enforce it and had staff if say an you know the, another plan is running simultaneous in which they're planning on putting paid parking up on an, in another area of you know, maybe they have a policing agency that is consolidated and does all the ticketing for all the paid parking areas. Maybe some portion of that can go up. I, I wasn't set in stone, but I just, as I thought about it, I just assumed that if it was all ran in-house from the Harbor Department and they're doing the ticketing for it, then yes. As, as a, a, a bullet item developed, by this discussion, by the have discussion that we would put forward, are you okay with saying that that revenue, without regard to how much revenue, revenue flows to the waterfront infrastructure? I am very comfortable with that. Okay, uh, waterfront infrastructure, or to the specifically to the harbor department, which brings us back to your point about who's who's man in the ship. We should maybe have a discussion on that. <laughs> that should be part of the discussion, I would say. Okay. I'm just spitballing here, so. Okay. I, I, because of my personal bias about the needs, the capital needs, 
my strong personal bias often expressed <laughs> about the the capital needs of, of the waterfront infrastructure and the fact that uh, there isn't a bunch of money to keep it alive and well. Uh, if there's going to be monies collected, to, uh, net revenues, net revenues collected from paid parking on the waterfront, I'd like to see it go to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. the, the department has its budget. Its budget is funded by the enterprise zone, by the revenues from the enterprise zone. That's just my thought. Jim? What exactly do you mean by the inter um, infrastructure? By infrastructure, I mean the the city-owned portions of the waterfront that are used by the public. East, east side of Embarcadero. Is yeah, all yeah. Of it. yeah, the east side of the Embarcadero. And then so, the tea piers, so, 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 the restaurants. So docks, piers. Capital equipment. That, or capital. that no, I don't know. That's as far as I'm concerned. That's the city's responsibility, not the harbor department's responsibility. I mean, things that are directly. Let's see. What's the best way to put this? Infrastructure that is directly related to the harbor itself. The the use that, that require capital the, improvements. The, the use the use and access to the, of, to the harbor by the public. As opposed to the harbor department budget, which is everything. On the Embarcadero. Well, it, uh, my understanding of the Harbor Department budget is that it's it's principally focuses around operations, and and if, and, and if there's yeah. a surplus, then then it goes into the capital fund. So you're talking about capital improvements. I am yes. talking about okay. capital improvements, but, but I want to say just improvements because that implies that to some people we're doing something new. Capital investments. Capital maintenance and improvements. Okay. Yes. So I'd like to then clarify based on that the net. I, I would like to see any of the net profits come back to the infrastructure. But I would just wanted to make sure that if the if the whoever manages it should I mean it should that should be part of the fee. So net profit is a good clarifier. You know, and, and you know, this discussion is 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 beyond this board in the sense that um, you know the city's going to do what they want to do. I mean, we we pay ninety thousand dollars to clean restrooms, but um, we have no control over that. Uh, the parking that we're discussing right now is east of the Embarcadero, which is city-owned. They're going to try to get their tentacles into that. Simple as that. And I think that is something that we, as the Harbor Board, Harbor Advisory Board, need to try to. Put our steps, put our first steps forward to try to manage it, collect it, and use it for the Embarcadero. Period. Okay, Mr. Director. You, yeah, I think you had your for finger the, up. <clears throat> Excuse me. You had your finger up. Yeah, yeah, I have my signaling device up. Um, all great input. I've taken a lot of good notes. I'm sure Laurie's catching a lot, and Ron, I know you are too. Um, I think. This particular conversation about revenues and expenses is going a little beyond where we need to go tonight. It's fine. We're doing it. It's great. It's good input. Um, I will say to kind of to piggyback on a little bit on where Bill started to go with this. Um, you know, if we, the Titans Trust is from you know the west side of Embarcadero on. If we pilot program the the city's parking lot that used to be the old trailer park, which is below the bluff, that's not in Titans Trust property. And so, I think. The, issue, the, the one item that I put in there, the, you know, the revenue, you know, the costs and revenues, I think that's a bigger rabbit hole that needs to go down because there are all, all those issues that there's a, a perfectly good argument that can be made that somebody that goes down and has dinner at or lunch at Harada and doesn't park in Harada's parking lot and uses paid parking, well, that's a customer on the other side of the road. The general fund should get some of that versus somebody that goes over to House of Juju and parks and could park on either side so there's no really way of knowing who goes where but there's got to be some sort of way of, of doing a, a fair cost sharing because as Bill says uh, the general fund and I think rightly so is going to deserve some sort of revenue from paid parking in and around the Embarcadero and it's just a matter of how you determine that uh, but I think it's they're all good points and that's a, a pretty big rabbit hole to go down. Well I think we spent an uh, I appreciate that, and I think we spent enough time on it. It is within 
uh, the scope of the agenda item. Oh, absolutely, and it's a major item to, and a major issue to consider for sure. It's, I think, it's one of the biggest. So, uh, so let's talk about um, let's talk about the concept of permits. Did you have something, Jane? Well, I was going to say, if we um, don't consider the parking lot on the east side of the Embarcadero, we do have the street ends, and those are separate entities on each street end. That's a great point. That's a great point. And there's several of them. Quite a, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge parking lot by GAFCO all the way down past Coast Guard. And that, that could very well easily be handled by a uh, key sock. Just like Avila Beach, you know, you go park in Avila Beach, but they got a lot of free places all over the place too. So first come, first serve. Okay, just give me a second here. Let me get that down. Okay. So let's kick around the notion of permitting. What does that mean, Rob? It means that we do we are there user groups all the way from every resident of Morro Bay down to um, maybe at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of uh, population uh, fishermen who lease slips from the city. Uh, thousands of folks on one side and dozens of folks on the other side uh, and there's a, several possible Neil's pretty good about rolling off half a dozen of them so what about the concept of, of permitting for and, it, and there's the concept of paid permits and the concept of free permits and we're still within this overall umbrella issue of paid parking along the waterfront what does the board think about? Well, uh, should there be should should some user group get a free permit? They got a sticker on their windshield. They can park along the waterfront on the presumption that there's paid work parking along the waterfront, and they park for free. Is there any user group that would qualify for that? Mr. Leaseholder, I might be a little biased here. <laughs> That's okay. I might be a little biased here, but yeah, I would say leaseholders, people who are currently paying directly to the city, paying taxes, I'm not saying that every resident, I guess, is paying taxes, but that are daily operating, um, when they signed their leases, these weren't, weren't in place. This wasn't a contingency that they had to contemplate when they signed these long-term leases. So to put that on them now might be considered possibly a burden that they didn't sign up for. So some kind of allowance for a limited parking. I'm not saying every employee, uh, you know, I've, I've got a handful of employees. Maybe I, at my building I have two or, you know, for management, for owner slash management. And the rest are, um, you know, my employees can either buy their own permit or I could offer that as a bonus to my employees or, you know, something else. But, um, and... You know, the same thing could be said, just consider fishermen business owners, I would say. So if you're a leaseholder and you're currently paying a slip fee, uh, you know, could that be granted or, you know, grandfathered in with your, your slip rent? Possibly. Um, and I know not, I mean, Owen owns a boat, but he has crew, so at what point does, you know, how many does he get? So it's a good discussion, I think, to have. But... So at the highest, uh, sort of at the highest elevation, you, you, you think that it's worthwhile if there was paid parking on the waterfront to incorporate some number of free parking permits for leaseholders or slip holders or some group? Identified groups, yeah. Okay. okay, and Bill, what do you think of that? I, I think the same idea. I mean, when we initiated the key socks down there at the landing, we offered the general public, I believe, a uh, hundred dollar annual permit. Is that correct? Yeah, originally started a hundred. Yeah, a hundred dollars, so they could use it every day, and um, 
Um, so I think whether or not we do it free or we do it for a fee, that's another discussion, but I think there should be some type of other types of permits, specifically for the leaseholders. And some leaseholders don't. At my, I have parking at my spot where I could, I could park on my, in my building. Some people might not have that option where they don't have parking. It's all, you know, especially from basically Giovanni's on. He's got a parking lot, but most of the businesses heading south don't have a parking lot on the water side. But yeah, they have the ends, the road ends, but that's about it. Well, uh, uh, speaking, of, you said Giovanni's, and yeah, there's, he does have parking off-street parking, so does Gordon at the coffee pot. Um, and Gordon is, I can tell you, really fierce about not letting his employees or himself park in, park in front of his building in, in that area. So uh, that's, a, that's a consideration that, yes, some businesses do, but the vast majority do not right. have mm -hmm. off-street parking. Right. Lynn? Um, I... Uh... Hmm. I think uh, probably the annual permits to those who are employed or are associated closely with some leaseholder. I think that would be necessary. Free or paid? Uh, paid but moderate payment. I'm, I'm thinking about those who work seven or eight hours a day someplace down there and are not high wage earners. They need to park someplace. Um, unless there were free parking, not. Well, if there's free parking, then forget. Well, no, wait a sec. So, uh, no, so let's think about those workers. So, so let's assume, let's say hypothetically the triangle lot is free parking which is a quarter of a mile from, from downtown. And it's got a trolley, not all the time. No, it doesn't. No, let's it assume, doesn't let's have assume the it doesn't have the trolley, and it's winter. Is that okay or is that not okay? That's really inconvenient, but you have the other end where there is free parking down at Tidelands for a car. So at each end of the Embarcadero, which means you only have to walk half the Embarcadero, um, that wouldn't be terribly unreasonable. Um, and for employees, that might be good enough. Gene, you shook your head. In, in the past, when they talked about employees parking, the, the issue was safety. If you have some employee working till 10 o'clock at night, they really don't want to want them walking a quarter of a mile in the dark somewhere. So, um, mm. They need to have some kind of safe area that they park nearby. Well, one of the things that Neil brought up is that um, we can we can have free parking after 6 p.m. I mean, that's what they do in San Luis. I mean, that, that you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to limit that. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I go to the Embarcadero every day just about, just, you know, you, you go there, you know, you're, you live there. But you don't see a lot of cars at night. You, you really don't. It just seems to be during the day that it's just really jam-packed. And then something else to consider with this parking is, I mean, if I worked in the middle of the Embarcadero, I'm probably not going to go down to one of the end lots. I'll probably just go up one of the side streets and go up, you know, into, you know, up the hill and park somewhere up there. And what impact will that have on neighbors? Well, they do it right now. Right. So, but I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as my own business, I, if depending on how it was, where it was phased in, I guess I may or may not be affected. But it seems like it would be nice for businesses to have some permits. You're a slip holder, are you not? Yes, I am. Yeah. And where's your slip? Uh, mine is between Gafco and the fuel dock. So, but then so there are those slips near Giovanni's, and I think those. Those folks already have some parking problems, so it could have benefit them even, I guess, <laughs> depending on what, what happened there. Okay. Anything else gainfully we could, Gene? Yeah, as far as um, the locals or the business people, I think they probably should have a permit and a nominal fee 
one thing we need to consider is in in the future there's a whole lot more um, motels being proposed on the Barcadero hotels more or less and that's going to bring more and more people who have to park in place and on the west side there is no parking so those developers or those new um, businesses are paying in lieu fees but they're not providing any parking at this point so um, I think maybe the businesses owners should perhaps get a, a, a parking permit and a nominal fee, uh, kind of like the boat launch fee. So. One more point. A permit also doesn't guarantee you parking. It just means if you find a parking spot, you wouldn't have to pay in it. So as it gets busier, it's not, you could still generate funds in them, and if you, you just have to get there earlier to get parking, first come, first serve. Well, I hadn't thought of this before, but okay. Um, if, if you're a slip holder or a leaseholder, can you rent a park? Should be, you be able to rent a parking spot for a year from the city? No. No. I'm just spitballing here, folks. So. <laughs> No. Can, can you sub rent out that spot? Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> I'm making this up as I go along. <laughs> okay, if you're renting, if you're renting a mooring ball, does that uh, entitle you to some kind of parking? You're already paying for that to the city or to somebody. Good question. <laughs> That's a good question. And, it, and that was just the idea of being free. If we go that route, you could also just include a fee, f like f for all the leaseholders. That was what if we all paid a hundred dollars for per permit or something. There could be a fee that gets attached to boat owners, moorings, whatever. However, we lump the whole group in. It was just my initial concept of no. <laughs> I don't, you know, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm so. So another op so another option, not an alternative, another option, this is a question, not a statement, another option relative to paid parking would be fee parking for some set of users. Right, and, and the users, we might get a scaled down version. Um, you know, that can all be determined also if you go that route. Um, Eric, um, in the, um, or Lori, in the lease, assignments that you have with your leaseholders, is there any mention in parking? No. No. Okay, so let's see if we can gainfully talk about any other bullets before we wrap this up. Tonight do we want to Opine as to where we think the optimal spots for paid parking around the waterfront are, or do we, or is that something best left to the planners? Well, I think that you know, Ron, considering that this is going to be a joint, as as Gene said, this is going to be part of public works, going to be part of planning, this is going to be part of a variety of agencies or different departments, there should be a, I think our board here should maybe make a recommendation, should we have paid parking or not, period. And then we go from here in maybe a joint a subgroup between those parties and we, we start ironing out some things. That's my feeling. And yeah, might, might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think you know maybe not so much an ad hoc committee, but uh, it's it's like the wa the working waterfront or the Measure D that you're having. I mean, if there's going to be more than one person that's going to voice in on this, um, it has to be from the other bodies too. Well, that's a that's in the works uh, yeah. already. So, and I haven't I haven't thought this through. So this is this is not well thought out. Well, that's okay. So, I mean, I, I think hang on, that. Hang on a sec. So, when the when those meetings take or that meeting or those meetings take place, um, uh, I'm happy to represent the combined thinking uh, of the board, and I 
I would propose to, between Lori and Eric and myself, will develop a list of bullets, circulate those bullets to the board for its critical review, and then whenever that meeting is, any member of the board <coughs> that wants to participate, y'all come. Um, I had something in my mind, but it's gone now. Um, Can I add something, or you want to keep? <laughs> no, no, no. I need the time. So okay. Go ahead. So, so part of my comment earlier about identifying what what already exists for guests would be also, I mean, part of that would be identifying what part of that guest parking is would be part of the Tidelin, you know, as 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 blanketed under the Tideland Trust, how much parking spots exist. Because, I mean, I can think of all the way up from the intake building, past the intake building, actually, there's that parking lot that goes all the way out to Coleman Beach. Mm -hmm. And then it comes all the way down, you know, there's parking all the way on the water. All the way to Tideland. Yeah. Look, look, look. Parking lot or street parking. In that 1993 study you sent us, uh, Ron, uh, the state... Conservancy Commission was that is that the State Land Commission now voiced in do they have to have a say in this um, at all the, the State Land Commission State which, Lands Commission no I mean we're we're entrusted with operating the city's title okay. and the city incorporated Morro Bay it's even incorporated city of Morro Bay manages the rest of its own property Paid parking is typically, and we, for our launch ramp parking, it is a coastal commission issue. It's coastal development, and it's coastal access. Obviously, it has a, can have a potential effect on coastal access, so the, it's something that would have to eventually go in front of the coastal commission. Did, you, we, did we use the boat launch before the coastal commission? Yeah, we did that. We did that. Yeah. I'm... Eric, I, I, for your consideration, uh, I think we've gone as far with this agenda item as we're in a position to go to tonight. I don't see any need for a formal motion. No, uh, nor do I. I think, I think we've got just, a lot of good bullet we'll, points, we'll, we'll a lot of good consensus. I didn't hear a, a resounding heck no on any one item or grand, you know, the same thing, heck yes on any one item. I think good consensus, yeah, these are all things to look at. You know, some obviously differences of opinion on the different items, but just these are the items to be considered. Um, a couple things I just want to toss up and, and see if you salute it as well in terms of ideas to add to the list. Um, one is, and I'm assuming it is, is it it's, would be the most logical thing if any sort of paid parking is administered um, where there's different sets of parking, maybe pay here, free here, signage and directional information it would be an item I think would be worthy of consideration. That's something that we need to deal with? No, it's just an item to add to the list. What are the issues when it comes to paid parking, signage and directional information? Yeah. Ron, real quickly, one of the things that um, we may have to consider is anytime you do restriping or re-changing parking, then the ADA requirements kick in. So. We may have to think about that. Maybe not. Hopefully not. I, I would might. say that's a good thing to add anyhow. You know, yeah. lo lo loading, lo loading, or not. loading zones and handicap. Yes. And that was the other one I was going to bring up. Truck loading, um, how that filters in, how that factors in, and like say handicap accessibility, ADA accessibility, make sure that we're... Although the city has done a recent ADA um, study on all its facilities, I'm pretty sure that included our parking lots as well. So I... Uh, would think that once that process can, as that process continues to move forward, it's going to identify that we may be short on ADA accessibility in some area and okay on others. So that will could possibly feed into this. Anything else? The last minute words of wisdom. Are, are we looking at the the entire Thailand Trust? Um, um, the no, Rock? Not. Is the Rock part of? The, no. We just have to Gene, say it when we're talking it. about it. We could do it here with Gene. Okay. <laughs> I just have to say it. I mean, that knows the answer. He was well, looking I mean, for a resounding nose. <laughs> if you want to get in technical, Embarcadero goes out to the creek. Oh, okay. It's Coleman that goes out to the rock, and we've got agendizes on the Embarcadero. I guess it's an adjacent vicinity. So all the way out to where the walkover bridge is? So, well, so hang on. So, so let, before we go down that, that hole, uh, one, another one of Eric's rabbit holes, um, 
are we okay with thinking about it from uh, just because I can't think of a landmark that's south, more south, more southerly than that, from Marina to the Intake Building, as a area of consideration. Marina Street. Well, I'm Marina. Yeah, Marina Street. Isn't that the last street that that no. tees no. into the? No, not at all. Yeah, but you still got more business south of that. Thailand. You got to go all the way Thailand. down to Associate Pacific and those little buildings. There. Uh, oh, oh, okay, fine. Okay, so 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 what's okay to the to the northern boundary of Tidelands. From the northern boundary of Tidelands to the intake building? Yeah. Does that work for us as a hypothetical catchment area? We can also designate the rock as free parking and have signage that says, you know, it's part Je of Jeans free parking? Jeans, yeah. Jeans free parking. <laughs> Legacy parking. <laughs> But I mean, on it, you know. make sure we tell people that we're giving them free parking. If we're charging them here, just say there's free parking here. You know? Actually, that's a really good point as yeah. it relates to signage. Well, that comes into the signage. That's, yeah. I mean, that's typically what you see is the free parking lots are pointed out, and they're usually on the outskirts. And free, the prime yeah. stuff is what you charge for. Um, Ron? Yes, sir. Um, to be clear, so that the area between, the, I guess, the intake and associated with yeah, the playground um, would there there would potentially be free parking and paid parking phased in or right. they're just whatever but you're just, just you're just talking don't, about don't know I, I'm just talking okay. about the, the okay. hypothetical yeah, catchment yeah. area so um, why are you limiting it and not including a Tidelands Park because we if you're talking about parking that's a huge parking lot that ought to be planned for along and coordinated with parking on you're the rest of the Embarcadero. You're Darrow. absolutely correct. You're totally correct. Am I? Yeah. Wow. You often are totally correct. <laughs> yeah. Then you need to go down to the parking in the boat launch area, too. That's what I mean. Yeah. All the way down. And then up to Coleman Beach, there's parking. And then up to, to Coleman pass the Beach. Power plant. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so and I had another question. <laughs> Would this possibly contemplate a building a parking lot or well, that, paving the parking lot uh, one of those areas that are currently open and now people park in? Well, one of the, this, one of the study things that Ron sent us uh, when was a parking structure. And they do have, if they ever get a developer for the restaurants above, right. they are supposedly going to build a parking structure. So. Right, but that was back then. Are we now contemplating well, setting aside and having one of those current parking lots That's areas being paid parking? Uh, yeah, we, we yeah we kick that around. I mean, and and personally, I, I don't speak for the board. Personally, I think talking about a parking structure somewhere along the waterfront. Is uh, I, uh, is so far distant, uh, such a far distant possibility that I can't get it in my head. I agree. So, a parking structure is not necessarily a three-story building. It could be a single area that is either metered or enclosed or fenced, limited access, so that people pay for it, and it would be currently an empty lot. Of which there are a couple. Sure. That's all. I, I, I guess structure. I guess what I would, I, without regard to how many layer levels right. it might it's be, a it was it parking was, lot. It was, the, it was the concept of structure that I was hung up yeah. on. So it, it's okay, a parking Jean. lot. Okay, I got it, Gene. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Okay. Parking. <laughs> anything else? Okay. Gene, apparently you don't have anything else this evening. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're not quite done. So um, back to the agenda that brings us to um, future agenda, to the declaration of future agenda items. Uh, so we have some already pending. Does anybody want to propose an additional future agenda item? Do we keep parking on there? Yeah, well, I think we'll keep. Well, mm, no, we don't need to keep. And it's not a future. And it's not a future agenda item. So now it's a working agenda item. So probably not. Okay. Anything else? 
Gene? I would think that when Bohm comes up with their assessment of where they think they really want to do something or other, we need to see that before they put it out to a lease agreement. So, I don't know when that is, but that's a future agenda item. Five years from today. Mm -hmm. Well, the Trident um, site is already identified like pretty in, is pretty, in pretty good detail, but it's kind of vague as to where they are in the process to me anyway, having met with them. Well, but that's, that's Gene, that's totally right. I mean, without regard to the specifics of, of BOEM repeat presentation. Uh, and you heard Chris, I mean, he said he's will keep in touch and when he thinks he's to a point where they're needing maybe additional outreach or it's a point where um, it makes sense. I would say a point where it makes sense to us and to him, which may or may not be exactly the same point. I'm, I'm thinking about my experience with federal agencies and their process. You're being biased now, Ron. Um, no, I'm just ex no, I'm just being empirical. That's all. Not not biased. Owen, um, we had a a meeting with, or we were supposed to have a meeting with them on May or something. The fishermen, and then they couldn't come for some reason, so they rescheduled to now, which happens to be when four of our board of directors are off tuna fishing. So it would be really nice if if we could have some kind of similar meeting, probably not. Now we have to wait till probably at least October before those guys are back, but those are definitely important guys to have around. If you would send me an email and give me a, a sort of a, a calendar block of what would be optimum for you folks, that, that would be very helpful. Okay, anything else regarding future agenda items? Seeing none, I hear a motion to adjourn. I hear a motion. Is, is, there a, is there a second? I'll second that. <laughs> you can't second your own motion, oh, buddy. <laughs> no, no, he didn't actually okay. make the motion. <laughs> We're getting a tiny bit silly, but <laughs> good. Gene seconded it. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? None. Carries. No. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rod.